Welcome to the CTI's demonstration for external stakeholders. My name is Marianne Wood. I am Program Support Officer at the European Medicines Agency. We are now starting this event. Please note that it is recorded. We are using Slido to take questions during this event today. And you can see details on how to join Slido on screen now. Please note that the WebEx chat and microphone functions are disabled for attendees. I will now hand over to Dr. Fergus Sweeney. Fergus is head of the Clinical Studies and Manufacturing Task Force at the agency and has been involved in the setup and development of this system from the beginning. Fergus, I give you the floor. Thank you, Marianne, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and, and welcome to this uh, demonstration. I'm delighted to have so many stakeholders from, from member states and, and sponsors and, and others who are who are attending. It's a really important moment as we approach uh, 11 days from go live date. It's my great pleasure to welcome to this opening panel Dr. Xavier de Kuyper, who is Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Agency for Health Products in Belgium. But here today, uh, in particular, he's speaking on behalf of the heads of medicines agencies of the, the European Regulatory Network, where he is the, the mentor for clinical trials. So very welcome, Xavier. Uh, and he will uh, say opening words, uh, followed by Christophe Bonarens, who is from Section 4 of Director General Sante, at the European Commission, where he is team leader for pharmaceuticals and focusing on quality, safety, uh, and innovation. So welcome both to Dr. de Kuyper and Christoph von Ahrens. Uh, and uh, I invite uh, Dr. de Kuyper, Xavier, please uh, open the meeting for us. Thank you. Thank you, Fergus. Uh, good morning, everyone, and also for my Welcome to the many participants in this demonstration, uh, which prove uh, how much the CTIS is awaited by all those concerned with the management of clinical trials in Europe. We are today at the start of a new era, a new regulation, with the aim to promote clinical research within the European Union and to deliver a better health to our patients. We are indeed six working days from the go live of the CTIS and the clin clinical trials regulation on the 31st of January at nine o'clock to be precise. So many thanks again to everyone who has collaborated in this development of this huge project which creates a new environment. With every new regulation comes change. And with CTR and its system CTIS, there is no difference. How do we handle change? Be pragmatic and creative when needed. It's also by going step by step. And at the end, the best way is to be resilient and always continue. I think my main message to all of you is to work together. Certainly when we are talking about clinical trials, commercial and non-commercial sponsors as member states with their agencies and ethics organizations we make it a success together and in confidence. The success European patients deserve. Therefore, thank you to you all for attending this demo. And I wish you, and I certain it will be a fruitful day. I know it's my pleasure to hand over to Christoph Bonarens from the Commission. Good morning. Thank you, Xavier, and good morning to all. I'm extremely delighted to see so many people here in the meeting. Uh, this is an important demo, 
We're at an important point in time, 11 days away from the long-awaited uh, applicability of the clinical trials regulation. Colleagues, uh, I, I, want to, I do not want to go through a, a long uh, and boring talk on how the regulation was published in 2014, and we spent quite a long time to get the system, the clinical trials information system ready. So the only thing I want to say is I was extremely happy and I felt it an extreme honor to be involved in the publication of the uh, full functionality decision that was published on the 31st of July 2021 in the official journal. Because that did not only trigger uh, the go live, did not only confirm the full functionality of CTIS, it also set the, finally the date of entry application of the clinical trial regulation. It is in 11 days on the 31st of January 2022. I'm also quite happy to see that set of legislation, but also some other accompanying legislation enter into force on that exact same day. Uh, I'm, I'm talking and thinking specifically on a, a very final piece of legislation, the implementing regulation on coordinated safety assessment that we worked on quite hard with member states, with EMA, and that was adopted just in time to be applicable at the same day as the clinical trial regulation. So just as a reminder, what is this clinical trial regulation? Well, it's the new rules for clinical trial authorization in Europe, and they aim to harmonize submission, assessment, supervision of clinical trials throughout the EEA and the economic area. And as soon as, as it's applicable, that was the, the, the aim in 2014, the regulation will create a framework for robust and agile approval uh, by requiring close coordination between member states. In addition, and that was one of the um, major achievements and major asks from a political point of view, the CTR will ensure sufficient transparency and public scrutiny to help the research community and to build trust in clinical trials further than what we know today. So that was the aim. How will we get to that aim? Well, the CTR, the clinical trial regulation, defines the clinical trial information system for which we get the demo today as a single entry port for clinical trial applications. This means that all the parallel processes that we know up until today will at a certain point in time disappear and be replaced by a single submission, a single authorization and a single follow-up through CTIS. This is quite revolutionary and it's unique in the world. We hope and we count on it that this will streamline the application of a clinical trial application on the basis of CTR rules. Because the CTR does not only put an information system in place, it also puts a unique single submission to member states in place. Just a few words on the transition, because I already told you on the 31st of January 2022, the legal text will become applicable and CTIS can be used as the single entry point for clinical trial application submission. That is correct. But for one year, sponsors can still choose to go through CTIS or to use the current rules under the clinical trial directive. Call it a, a heating up period. Call it a period for training to gather expertise. One year later, exactly on the 31st of January 2023, every new clinical trial needs to be submitted to CTIS and needs to be authorized according to the CTR rules. So from that moment on, new clinical trial authorizations cannot be submitted through the old system. And last but not least, three years from now, a little bit more, all ongoing trials that are still running at that time will need to be transitioned to the CTR system. So it means that trials that are, are authorized today and will still run at uh, into 2025 will need to be transitioned at a certain point in time. So that, colleagues, friends, that is the message for today. Yes, there is a transition period. Yes, you have a year, but for every clinical trial that will be submitted as from the 31st of January 2023, 
As for each trial that still will be ongoing in 2025, we will have to get ready all together to submit and authorize and decide to the CTR system through CTIS. My last words are for everybody involved in this project, uh, wherever stakeholder organization they would come from, competent authorities, ethics committees, sponsors, EMA, commission, and uh, the, the, the contractor. My sincere personal thanks and the thanks from my organization for everybody involved to having come to this point. And a last word, as Xavi already did, wishing you all as audience success in your duties and responsibilities in CTIS. Uh, today, we start a trajectory together. We start a training and expertise building together. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And over to Fergus for some uh, additional words. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Xavier and Christoph. And indeed, it's been a enormous uh, teamwork across the, the European network, across all of our stakeholders from academia, from pharmaceutical industry, patients, uh, and of course our own team here at EMA, uh, IT and business, and, and our, our contractors working to support us. It's, it's a huge achievement. So we really now need to springboard and, and use the advantages. And the clinical trial regulation harmonizes the submission, assessment, and supervision of clinical trials in the European Union and economic area. And CTIS, which we'll be looking at today, is the business tool of the clinical trials regulation. And these together are there and really support and provide much more for public health, facilitating large-scale clinical trials to address key health issues. We have the EU beating cancer plan. We have all the experience of, of COVID-19. Uh, and it's clear we need large multinational trials. Also, even for rare diseases, we need to bring multiple member states and researchers across Europe together to reach out to, to all of the, the patients and, and healthcare professionals caring for them with their trials. It supports research and innovation, enabling knowledge sharing, expert collaboration, and building the network of researchers across member states through a single clinical trial application valid across the, the union and the economic area. And it will stimulate investment in research because it will bring clinical trials to us and ensure that Europe remains and indeed builds on its uh, enormous advantages as a clinical research hub globally. Key messages uh, which we should take home today and looking at the, the demonstration as we go through the day, CTIS will be the single entry point for clinical trials, information, clinical trial applications in the European Union and economic area. It provides a harmonized and simplified end-to-end -end electronic application procedure across the life cycle of clinical trials from the first application right through all of the recruitment period, the substantial modifications, trial closure, uh, and publication of results. The clinical trial regulation foresees, as Christoph has underlined, a three-year transition period. All initial applications will have to be submitted through CTIS as of the 1st of January 2023, and all continuing ongoing trials must have transferred by 31st of January 2025. CTIS will offer a transparent and searchable clinical trial information to patients, healthcare professionals, and the general public. They will be able to see trials which are open to recruitment, ongoing trials, but also the results of trials when they're available across all clinical trials conducted in the EU, whatever their, their purpose. And CTIS is a unique intuitive tool that facilitates the submission of clinical trial applications including those for multinational trials. So it's a single application valid for both competent authority, ethics committee, and registration in a public portal. And it's one application, whether you're going to work in one member state or all member states or anything in between. So really unique uh, platform and one that offers uh, enormous benefit. So with that, I'm happy now to hand over to my colleague, Laura Piotto, 
who's a CTIS uh, expert in our team uh, at the European Medicines Agency. Laura is a, a pharmacist uh, and has a long experience in clinical trials and pharmacovigilance, uh, both prior mm -hmm. to joining the agency uh, and since coming here in 2009. And over the last number of years, quite a few, Lara has been working on the development of CTIS uh, and has had a lead role uh, in its development, uh, testing, and in all the communication and, and training that we've conducted on that. So I'm very pleased now to hand over to Lara Pioppo, who will lead you through uh, the, the agenda and, and the various demonstration sessions, along with Melis Koyunkwar Gulari uh, and Olga Alvarez uh, from uh, uh, our developer who, who will be supporting her, and she, she can introduce them uh, and the coming sessions further. Myself and Christoph Van Ahrens will be joining you uh, later this afternoon for a question and answer session, but you will have short question and answer opportunities during each of the sessions that, that Lara will introduce and lead. And I remind you again to, to use the Slido for your questions because uh, colleagues are, are watching that carefully and will group your questions and we will do our best to answer uh, as many as we can. Hopefully some will be answered uh, indeed by the, the demo itself. So Laura, I'm very pleased to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Fergus, for the very kind introduction and good morning to everyone. Welcome to this uh, demo event on the clinical trial information system, CTIS. As you might have seen from the agenda that has been circulated in advance to the meeting today, we will have a detailed walkthrough of the main functionalities of the system. For each of the topics that we will present, we will have an introductory presentation just to set the objectives of what you will see then in the demo. We also have 10 minutes Q&A allocated for some of the topics and the last half an hour of the meeting event will be dedicated to um, a panel discussion. Please make the best use of Slido, as Marianne and Fergus were saying. This is your tool really to um, uh, engage with us and ask your question that will then be addressed during the Q&A um, session. Uh, if we can have maybe the first, um, the next slide, thank you, and the next one, please. So we dive now into the system uh, functionalities. The first topic that will be a demo today is about the user administration. What you will see in just 10 minutes, a uh, very quick um, demonstration of this first part, is about the fact that users will need to have credentials in order to be able to access the sponsor secure domain and the authority secure domain. Without a username and a password, the users will not be able to access the system. Once the users will be inside the system, there will be an administrator assigning them roles and permission in order for them to be able to perform activities in CTIS. We will then see the visibility of the user profile in the secure domain and the request a role functionality that is available for sponsor users only. And now really with great pleasure, I would like to introduce you our speakers for the day, our colleagues, our business analyst colleagues from Entity Data that will guide us through the system functionalities, Melis and Olga. So Melis Konjukugulari is a business analyst with five years of experience in IT consultancy and has been working in CTIS for the last two years. She has been involved in the analysis and design of several modules of, of the system and thus actively participated in the testing activities. Olga Alvarez is the business analyst team lead. She has eight years of experience in IT consultancy and six of them working in IT product definition and delivery. Olga has been working in CTIS for the last three and a half years and has been actively participating in the definition of the solution from the functional point of view, quality assurance point of view, and really um, coordinating the delivery and the validation of CTIS before go live. So Melis and Olga, the floor is yours for the first demo. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the demonstration of CTIS. And thank you, Laura, for the great introduction. So as stated by Laura, today uh, we are going to first start with the user administration. Um, we will just 
uh, walk through the uh, system, the login, uh, the user roles, and the user administration. I will just go to the system. Just bear with me. Okay, so uh, I opened Google Chrome and uh, we have our links prepared here to log into uh, workspaces. Here, as you can see, this is the sponsor workspace. We have the login page and the title is sponsor user. And then uh, I have here in the second window is the um, authority workspace. We have the exactly the same uh, login page with the title member state user. So to be able to uh, log into system, every users uh, will have their own uh, username and their own uh, credentials. Now we have already prepared our users for the uh, demo and we save them. So uh, now I will uh, log into system uh, with, uh, with the user we have prepared. So I just click the login. Okay. So this is the sponsor workspace. As you can see here, uh, we have some tabs here, clinical trials, notice alerts, annual safety reporting, RFI, and the user administration. We will go through the, these tabs uh, and will explain you better in the uh, coming sessions. Now, um, our first uh, topic is the user role and the user administration. So uh, I log into system with the sponsor admin role, and we have some admin roles in the system, such as MS admin, sponsor admin, EMA admin, and the um, CT admin. Those admin roles uh, are responsible of the user management, user role, and uh, permissions uh, activities. Here, uh, if I click the user administration, now I have this new screen uh, with the title administration of users. Then, uh, as you can see here, we have the assign new role button. So uh, admin users uh, will use this button to assign the roles to the other users. By clicking the assign new role, now I have this uh, pop-up here, assign role. So what I need to do, I need to write the user ID to be able to assign a new role to the roles that I would like to assign the role. And uh, within, the, my, within my organizations, then I, uh, I am able to assign the role. Here with the role field, uh, we can see all the sponsor users we have in the system. Application submitter, notification submitter, part two viewer. So all these roles um, have some um, permissions uh, that they can do their activities relate, related to their roles and permissions. Here also I can uh, select the scope, it can be either all trials, that, that means that I give this permission to that user for all trials, or it can be a specific trial, then I need to specify that CT number from here. I will just log out from sponsor admin and will log into system again with an um, empty user, blank user we call, so that user won't have any roles, then we will see the uh, difference in their display. So from clicking the username, I'm able to log out. So here with the empty uh, user, we don't have the RFI and the user administration tab. So I will just uh, show you how to check the roles. Uh, by clicking the username, we have uh, this small pop-up here with the personal profile, my roles, and logout. So if I click my roles, then as you can see here, there is nothing uh, displayed to me because this user is empty. Uh, with the empty user, what I can do, I can request a role from the sponsor admin. Then the sponsor admin is going to uh, either accept the role, uh, request, or reject. So by clicking request role, uh, I can fill all these fields here with my organization name, organization ID, and the role uh, I would like to have to my uh, user. Now let's go back to the sponsor admin. Yes. From sponsor admin, uh, here I have options to either approve or reject the user request. So for this one, uh, this is another user and uh, I can approve their request or reject or even uh, revoke their permissions. So I will just quickly show you the same things from the member state. 
again, um, this is a member state user and this, rule, rule, this user has uh, a lot of permissions here because as you can see, we have uh, lots of tabs here, ad hoc assessments, user administration, inspections, um, and the service status and notice alerts. So uh, the same page, uh, same display also from member state. By clicking the user administration, I have exactly the same screen here. I am able to assign the roles to uh, this time to authority users. Now I have uh, only um, the authority roles here. I don't see any sponsor related user uh, roles. And uh, doing exactly the same steps, uh, I am able to assign to the roles to the uh, authority users here. So just uh, going to the system again with an empty user to member state, uh, authority workspace, sorry. So this user is empty. That means uh, this user doesn't have any roles. So uh, as you can see the difference from the tab, uh, I have only one tab while the uh, other user that I just log in with has uh, multiple tabs here because that user has various uh, permissions. Um, but now uh, with this empty user, I can show you from here because there is no role here. I am only able to see the clinical trials tab. So uh, with this quick introduction, we just finished with the user administration. Uh, I'm giving the floor to Laura back again to continue with the uh, slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melis. So now we will have time to um, walk you through the completion of an initial clinical trial application from the sponsor side, then progress with the submission of the CTA and go through the steps of the evaluation performed by the member states concerned. So you will see the selection of the RMS because we will use a multinational clinical trials, the validation phase, the assessment of part one and part two with an RFI, so a request for information raised to the sponsor and the decision phase issued by each member states concerned. Can we go to the next, next one, please? Thank you. So now more on the details of the clinical trial application, what uh, a sponsor user will see once they access the system, what they will have to complete. There is the form section that is extremely important because it's the part of the application where the user will provide the cover letter, the proof of payment, and will set the timelines for the deferrals. So in case the sponsor wish to apply for a deferral to delay the publication of data and documents in the CTA, they will have to record this information in the form section. The member state's concern is where the sponsor will um, specify in which member states they intend to conduct the clinical trial. Then we have part one and part two, of course, are. Um, uh, described in the in the regulation and extensively in Annex 1, the content of these two parts. Part 1 is the part of the dossier that contains uh, data and documents more of scientific nature, such as the protocol details, study design details, uh, all the documentation on the products that are used in the trial, regardless of the role, test, comparator, auxiliary, is all provided in part one, as well as the sponsor contact details and contact point in the union. The assessment of part one, I'm sure you are aware, is, uh, is conducted by the RMS, that is the member states in the lead, and this evaluation is done in conjunction with the member states concerned. Part two instead contains the data and document more of ethical nature and evaluation of the documents in part two is of pertinence of each individual member states is where we have the details of the clinical investigator sites, the details of the principal investigators, the CV, recruitment arrangement, suitability of the sites, and this is assessed individually by each member state's concern. The content and the structure of the CTA of the, of the dossier that is built in CTIS is in line with the requirements of Annex 1 of the Clinical Trial Regulation. And regarding the language, the Article 26 of the regulation is really clear that it is up to the member states concerned to determine the language of the dossier. So this is just to give you a flavor of the various components that we will have in, a, in an initial clinical trial application. If we go to the next one, please. 
Thank you. This is really to emphasize the fact that we um, that CTIS consumes data from existing data sources that we have at the agency. So you can see at the center of the slides the CTIS uh, that is made of the EU portal and database describing the Article 80 and 81 of the regulation. Part of the database, the vast majority of the information in the database is published and then there is also in CTIS a dedicated module for the submission of annual safety reports, which will also be demonstrated today. CTIS consumes data from the existing databases, so product details will be taken from the existing XCVMPD, the Extended Eudra Vigilance Medicinal Product Dictionary, organization details for the sponsors, but as well as for CRO and third parties, as well as clinical investigator sites will be taken from OMS, the Organization Management Service, and details of the users will be, um, of course, managed via IAM. So if you already have uh, user credentials because you access SPORE or you have access to Udralink, you will be able to reuse these credentials to access a CTIS. And um, the next one, please. Yes, no, I think we can stop here then and uh, because this is already the evaluation part, so I'll give the floor to Melis and Olga for the demo on the initial application from the sponsor side. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So uh, we are now going to start the, the demo of the initial application creation. So for that, we are going to open, go to just separate this. So we're going to open the sponsor workspace. We are going to log in uh, to the same user. So as my colleague Melis was explaining, uh, the users will have different roles. Uh, but today for demo purposes, uh, we are going to use one single user that has all the roles combined. So they will be able to see everything and, and do all the actions in the system. Um, because they have all the roles. So uh, in order for us to create an initial application in the system, we would need to access the clinical trials tab where we have the new trial option. And um, the, the first thing that we would need to inform would be the full title for our trial. And here we can look for our organization in the system. This data, as Laura was uh, explaining a minute ago, they are retrieved from the organization's database. Uh, we also have this option when we create a trial to uh, mark this trial as a transition trial, which would allow us to transition trials from the directive into CTIS, in case the users want to, and link this CTIS trial to the UDRA city trial number that we already had. For the purpose of this demo, we have uh, a, an initial application that has uh, already created and it's in, it's in draft, uh, ready for us to submit it so that we can show um, in the allocated time all the fields that can be populated in, in our initial application. So uh, this clinical trials page uh, will allow us not only to create a new trial, but as you can see, to search for existing trials that are already created in the system. We have uh, a basic search, and as you will be seeing throughout this demo, um, this structure, this page structure, is uh, the same in, in most of the screens in the system. We will have a search at the top of the page, and uh, we have a basic search that will allow us to search directly with our CT number, for example, and a, an advanced search where we will have more fields that we can use to refine our search. Uh, for example, in case of, train, of the clinical trials, we can search by trial status, the title, the sponsor, um, and other fields in the system. We can also search uh, transition trials precisely. We can use any inform dates in the trial to refine our search and look for our trials. But if we have the clinical trial number, we can do it directly from the basic search. And that's what I'm going to do. We have this trial already prepared for us.
Okay, so I have typed my clinical trial number and the system will retrieve my clinical trial, which is already created. And this is how the search results will look like. Uh, we can see the status of our clinical trial. It has not been submitted yet. It has been saved as draft, so the status is pending. And uh, we will see a summary of the main details. We can click on the clinical trial number and we will get to the trial summary where we will see a, a more specific set of information for, for this trial. This would be like our main page to work on the trial from now onwards. We will see a summary of the trial information and we will navigate through the rest of the sections during the, the rest of this demo. For the purpose of the, of the submission demo, I'm going to navigate to the applications directly, which is the last section in the trial summary. Here you will see a list of the applications that have been submitted for that clinical trial. In this case, only the initial application has been submitted, uh, sorry, created, because it has not been submitted yet, and that is why we see it's in draft. Our clinical trial application has two member states, Denmark and Spain, and we are going to access it to see how it looks like. So this is the clinical trial application. We can see the title um, on the top part of the page. We can also see the trial number. We can also see them. Uh, we see the type of application, in this case initial, and the status, which is draft for the moment. We can see here on the left hand side, we see a menu with all the different sections that are part of our application and we can navigate through them. We will see a set of buttons here that will allow us to work with our application and the sections are displayed in the form of accordions that you can fold or unfold to display the information. You will see that in all the applications and actually in most of the sections in the system that we will be working with, you will see this padlock icon. This padlock icon is used to um, lock the, inf the, the information in the section that we are working on and this uh, has been implemented to uh, make sure that in case several users are working on the same application at the same time, the information is not overlapping and there is no information loss. So in that sense, if I am a user that wants to work on the trial details and there is one colleague that wants to work with the sponsor sections in parallel, they can do it because they will have independent padlocks and I will be sure that no one else is editing the same section at the same time and therefore no information will be lost or overwritten. So the first step to edit any section in the sponsor workspace when we are creating an initial application is to select the section that we would like to edit and lock the padlock. So that way, all the sections will be um, enabled for us to update. If we finish our updates, we just need to remember to always click the padlock again to save the information and update the information in the application. So uh, Laura has already given uh, an overview of the different sections that uh, compose uh, an initial application. So let's uh, quickly see them all in, in the system directly. So we have, first one would be the form detail. Here we have the initial application details. As you can see, we also have some padlocks here to make sure that uh, the information is uh, correctly saved and that there's no overlapping. We have the cover letter. As you see here, it has been already uploaded. Okay, we have pre-populated this CD uh, so that you see how the information will look like. We have the cover letter for the application. You will see that there is a little asterisk here. This asterisk uh, is uh, present in all the fields that are mandatory uh, for the application to be submitted. So for each field that has to be uh, mandatorily populated, you will see an asterisk. 
and uh, another tip to make sure that uh, you fill in all the mandatory information is that you will see here the check button. This check button will help you while you are populating your application. This will help you to make sure that you have uh, indeed filled in all the mandatory details. If you click on the check button while you are editing, you will get a message saying in this case that the application is valid, which means that all the required fields have been populated. And if there were some missing, you would see an error message. And the, the fields, the required fields that are missing will be highlighted. We will see that in a minute. So uh, back to the form section, we can see the cover letter. We can also upload the proof of payment of fee for each of the member states that we have already um, added to our clinical trial. We can also upload the compliance with regulation document. And we have also the deferral publication uh, section. This section will allow the user I'm going to lock it. I'm going to lock it just to show how this will work. You see how the fields are enabled after I click on the padlock. So the, the clinical trial information can be deferred or the sponsor can request a deferral in the public in the clinical trial information publication. Um, this means that uh, the information that is supposed to become public after the trial gets decided uh, will be uh, deferred to, to some extent if the sponsor requests so. So that will depend basically on the, on the category of the trial, depending on the category that you select. Different publication rules will apply by default to our trial, but we can also manually set the, the dates uh, that we would like our information to be published. So by default, all the information will have a publication date. You will see that uh, most of the fields here will have the date of decision as the publication date. That will mean that at the date that the, the first MSC has made a decision on the trial, the information will become public in our public uh, portal. For other sections, for example, the clinical trial results, uh, the default value is that 12 months um, after the interim data analysis date, they will become public. This is for, of course, a, a category one trial, uh, but depending on the category that we select, the, the values will change. So for example, here in the category one, it's um, the, the subject information sheet publication date is set to the date of decision, but I can choose to change it and manually enter, for example, one year and three months after the end of the trial. You can change manually all the deferrals. And uh, that will be for category one, but just going to quickly show that if we change, for example, to category two, we get a uh, message informing us that this will change uh, the deferrals that we might have set and they will be reset. So after we change to category two, you will see that uh, the, the, the option to defer, for example, the, the results have disappeared. We will only see the subject information sheet, protocol, and summary of scientific advice, IMPD, safety and efficacy, and IB, and the responses to the RFI. They are also set by default to the date of decision, but we can manually change that and set it to something different. For example, one year and six months. And if we change again to category three, get the message again. And we'll see that we have even less options for the category three trials. But still, we have the option to change it. In this case, we cannot manually enter, but it will be changed to the publication of the final summary of results. So I'm going to go back to category one. 
and I'm going to set uh, one deferral, for example, for the protocol to two years, for example. The IMPD safety and efficacy and investigate or brochure, two years as well. And to the responses to the RFIs, which is the request for information that might be received, to one year and a half. So once I finish editing my information, I need to remember to click on the padlock so that the information is refreshed and saved. So now we see that the fields are disabled for update. I cannot do anything. And the information is saved. So that will be for the form section of the initial application. If I move to the next section, which would be the MSC section, the member states concerned, here I can add all the member states concerned that will take part in my clinical trial. And I can propose also which of the two of the MSCs that I select will be uh, the proposed RMS, the proposed RMS by the sponsor. We will see in a minute after we submit the initial application how the RMS is selected in the system. Because even though the sponsor will propose one, uh, there will be this um, expression of willingness and willingness and this RMS selection process. But the sponsor can already set their preferences here. We also have the padlock. Padlock will accompany us throughout all the applications. And once we click it, we can actually edit the information. We can add the number of subjects that will take part in the trial for that MSC. Let's uh, click on the padlock again. So that will be for the MSC section. We can also add the data about the countries outside the European Economic Area and the estimated total population for the trial. And we can move to the part one, which is the, the common area, the, the common part of the, of the clinical trial where all the trial details Will be, will be informed, also the information about the sponsors and the products that will be used in the clinical trial. So we have these three big blocks, trial details, sponsors, and products, each of them with a padlock. So that way, if I am working in the trial, in the trial details and some, some other user from my organization logs in and wants to edit the initial application, if they try to click on the padlock for the trial details, they will get a message saying that the, that the section is, is locked by another user and they cannot work on that section. They would need to uh, work on another section. They will also use their padlock and that way uh, they will be the only ones able to edit that part until they unlock it again. So let's quickly see the trial details section. We have the trial identifiers with a full title field where we can uh, type a uh, free text with the full title of our clinical trial. In this case, it has been already populated. And we can add translations to that full title. It will be proposed in English as the main field, but we can add any translations that we would like to have. In this case, we have added some translations for the two member state concerns that we have, Denmark and Spain. So we have added two translations. Of course, um, we have added this uh, dummy data uh, for testing purposes. Then we have the public title, also in English, for which we can also add some translations here. So we would click here, select the language, so Danish, and add the translation here. So if we confirm, we will add the translation here. We will see that the translation has been added. If we want to add the translation in Spanish, we would select the language. 
practice. As you can see, it's not possible to select Danish because we have already added it. So we will add Spanish and we will add the title. So now we see that we have both translations added under the public title. The rest of the fields in the clinical trial details would be the protocol code um, and some secondary identifier numbers that we can also populate in the system. Of course, this is all um, test data, dummy data, that it's not uh, real information. We can add additional registries. And then we would jump to the next section, the next accordion, which would be trial information. So we can click on the accordion to unfold it. And here we can specify whether our trial is a low intervention trial with our justification, the trial phase, the medical conditions that it will cover, also with the possibility to add translations. This will accompany us all throughout the, all the part one. The therapeutic area, the MEDRA information as well, where we can search for it and add it, the records here. The main objectives for the trial, the trial scope, secondary objectives, the eligibility criteria, uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, the endpoints, primary and secondary, the trial duration, we can provide an estimated recruitment start date and an estimated end of trial date. It has to be always in the future. The source of monetary support or material support and the population of trial subjects. For that field, we would need to inform several data here. The age range, where we can just, uh, in this case, we have informed that it will be 65 plus years. So people over 65, but we can click there. As you can see, if you click on the field, let me just remove that just to show you. You can click here and have the information populated. 65 plus year, 0, 17 years, that will be for pediatric subjects. We can select more than one value here. We have the age range secondary identifier. In case we have pediatric subjects, we can uh, select a secondary identifier. For example, if I select the pediatric subjects, I will have here a secondary identifier. Let me just remove the pediatric and stay with 65 plus. We can select the sex of the subjects, whether they are male or female or both. The clinical trial group, whether they are healthy volunteers or patients, the recruitment population group, in case uh, we have nursing women, pregnant women, subjects incapable of giving consent. That will be for the trial subjects. And I have another accordion for the protocol information where I can upload my protocol document here. This is how a document uploaded to the system will look like. So you can see here we have the icon uh, indicating the type of document that we have uploaded. In this case, the protocol has to be a PDF document. We will see the, the document name and some options uh, for you to work with the document. We can either download it, edit the metadata of the document, which would be the title, the language, then the version number, the date that it has been submitted, or even some comments if we want to add them. We will have the option to update the document directly, to update the file. The option to delete the document, to remove it. And we have this option here, this plus icon, to add uh, a, a second document. In this case, for the protocol, the default document that will be uploaded will be the protocol for publication. This is also an important concept that we will be handling through CTIS. So as, as you know, the clinical trial information will be public. It will be published after the decision date of the trial. And uh, 
we will have some different documents uploaded all throughout the application that will be either for publication or not for publication. Of course, there will be some confidential restricted information documents that are not to be, to be published. And we will see some examples as we navigate through the application. But in the case of the protocol, for example, the default document, that the mandatory document that we will have to upload is the for publication document. But once we have uploaded our document for publication, the mandatory one, we can click on the add icon and we can upload a second document. Let me look for it, I have it here. We'll just take a dummy document and upload the protocol. Will be, of course, this will not be a real name, but uh, just for testing purposes, that will be the protocol, not for publication. And as you can see, the type will already be defined to protocol not for publication. We can select the language of the document, the version, and the date and add any comments if we need it. We will attach it. And then you will see that we have two documents for the protocol. We have the protocol for publication and the protocol not for publication, which means that when the trial gets published, only the for publication document will be displayed in the public portal. This not for publication document will only be visible in the workspace, in the private workspace. It will not be shown in the, in the public website. Some of the documents that we can upload is the synopsis of the protocol, the data safety monitoring committee charter, and we have the study design information, the period details information, the scientific advice and pediatric investigation plan, and uh, we can also associate some uh, additional clinical trials just to link them to the clinical trial in process. We can add some online references and also some countries outside of the European economic area, which will, of course, not be involved in the assessment of the trial in CTIS, but we can add their names there and also the, the number of, uh, of total subjects in the rest of the world. So with that, we have finished our, our trial details section. Let me just scroll up because remember that I have changed some information. So now I would need to save it and to unlock my section in case one of my colleagues wants to come and complete uh, some information. So I will just click on lock. The information will be saved. Okay, I can use the check button again to make sure that the information is complete and that the application is valid. This application is valid. So I will just go a bit down and show you the sponsors section. So as we could see a while ago, the sponsor will be uh, populated at the very beginning, at the, at the very creation of the, of the clinical trial. We will be searching the organization details for the sponsor organization in the, in the external organizations database in OMS. And this information will be pre-populated to our cities, but we can add some additional information such as the contact point of course, these are all fictive details. The contact, and if I click on the lock just to show you the whole thing, here we will see that we have the main sponsor details. Of course, we can add additional sponsors here. We have the legal representative details, also with the contact. The scientific and public contact point and any third parties involved. So the contact point for the union. So this will be all the information that we can provide under the sponsor section. I'm going to click on the lock again to 
confirm that I have finished. And I'm going to jump to the last section in the part one, which is the products section. I'm going to lock it for editing. So in the product section, you will find also several accordions. The main accordions will be uh, the rolls. So we will have one accordion per roll that we can add from here. We can choose to add a test block, a comparator block, an auxiliary block, or a placebo block. So we just need to make sure the sponsor organizations would need to make sure that the products that they want to use are registered in the EV database from which we are consuming all this information about the products. And then we will add our role. So for example, let's start with the, with the test products. So we will open the accordion and from here we can add any product, any authorized product, ATC or substance or any unauthorized product that are registered as well. We have to, again, make sure that our products are registered in order for us to be able to, to retrieve them uh, for, for CTIS uh, purposes. And we can also have here our option to register the products directly from CTIS. So that will take us to the, to the registry form uh, to just make sure that our products are recorded and can be retrieved. So in the case of the test role, we have already added one product here. If I click on the product, all the sections related to that product will be displayed. We have the medicinal product details, the product characteristics, the dosage and administration details, the information about modification of the medicinal product, whether it has been modified in relation to its marketing authorization or not. Just have yes and no here. Product classification, which is taken directly from, from the product details. Also the product authorization details. Orphan designation, where we can actually say whether it has an orphan designation or not. The details of the active substance associated to that product. We can also indicate whether uh, contains an advanced therapy medicinal product or not. And we can link a device associated to that medicinal product here. So this would be the details for the product that we have linked. And we can also have here some information about that medicinal product. We have the investigator brochure document to be uploaded here. Again, as you can see, the default value would be that the document will be for publication, although we have seen that the sponsor can request to have some deferred information for this section as well. If we wanted to add a note for publication version, we could click here and add an additional document that will be not for publication. We also have the summary of product characteristics. As you can see, the structure for the documents is always the same. We will have all the options here on the right-hand side. We have the compliance with GMP for the medicinal product. And we have the quality section. I would like to just stop a bit uh, on this section. Yeah, sorry, just scrolled up. I would like to stop for a minute in the in the IMPD quality section just to highlight that this would be one of these restricted uh, sections that we were that we were talking about um, when my colleague Melis was doing this introduction about the the roles and the user administration. Uh, she mentioned that uh, each user will have some roles assigned um, that will. Um, condition, what they can see, and what they can do in the system, the actions that they can take. So this is a good example. Uh, for example, the IMPD quality section of the, of the clinical trial application is strictly controlled uh, by a specific role. There is one specific role 
in both the sponsor workspace and in the authority workspace that will have the visibility to see and work with this document. So this will be completely restricted information also from the sponsor workspace, the city admin will have the visibility, but for example, the application submitter role will not have it. So that's a good example that we can use to explain the importance of the roles that the users have assigned in the, in the system, because they will be seeing or not some information. We will also see uh, the importance of the quality section when we get to the, to the member state concern part in the assessment, because they will also have some some rules to restrict the visibility of the information related to the to the IMPD quality section. So in this case we have already uploaded a document. We can also upload the simplified IMPD queue and then we have the IMPD safety and efficacy section. This document, uh, sorry I forgot to, to say that the IMPD quality section will by default be not for publication, but the safety and efficacy part will be by default for publication. Okay, so that was it for our test product and we can close the accordion. We can see that depending on the role that we have, the information that we will see is of course different. For example, we have also added a placebo and you will see that for the placebo, we don't have that many fields to fill in. We have the DMP, the placebo section where we can directly add the IMPD queue. We can link products to that placebo and that will be it for the placebo. So we have uh, less information uh, to be populated there. If we go to the comparator, for example, we will see also other fields. The, sorry, I need to click here. Yeah, so we will see uh, more or less the same fields that we will see for the for the test products. Also the MPD quality section is here. Safety and efficacy. And we have the content labeling section that we can link to the specific products in the system, in the in the clinical trial. Sorry. So that would be it also for the product section. And at the very end of the part one, and we will see that also for the part one, we have this all document section where we will see uh, a compendium of all the documents that have been uploaded uh, to the application for the part one. And we can see the whole list. You can see the protocol, cover letter, the protocol synopsis, proof of payment, compliance with regulation, scientific advice, all the documents related to the products, and you see that the options are the same as if we were working on the on the actual section. So before I leave this section, let me confirm that I have finished my work. Unlock and release the section. Save the information. And now I can move on to the next section. That will be the part two. Thank you very much, Olga, for the very detailed demonstration of the part one um, of the clinical trial application form. So you have seen the trial details, uh, extensive description of the product details, and also in this section we have all the sponsor details. Maybe because we are okay with the time, uh, we could take now some of the questions. And thank you very much for all the questions that you are raising or, uh, that you are raising in Slido already. So um, before we, we move to this short Q&A uh, session, I'm really delighted to introduce the uh, experienced panelists that we have together today um, with us. Uh, Marianne Lunzer, Rudiger Pankov, and Anna Rodriguez. So Marianne Lunzer is um, a medical doctor currently working as a safety assessor in the clinical trial department of the Austrian agency AGES. She has been a CTFG alternate since 2017 and a CTIS member states product owners since 2019. Marianne has also served as a pharmacovigilance assessor and was an alternate member of the PRAC, of the Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee. 
Rudiger Pankov is a molecular biologist by profession and the principal consultant for regulatory affairs at Parexel, where he has 14 years of experience in global clinical trials management and regulatory consulting. Representing ACRO, Rudiger has been continuously involved since 2016 in various EMA activities for CTIS development, and since 2019, uh, Rudiger has been involved as a sponsor product owner for CTIS delivery and also expert in the validation of the training modules for CTIS. And Anna Rodriguez is the Deputy Program Manager for the, for the CTIS um, Development Project. Anna holds a PhD in Molecular Biology, has, um, has worked in the pharmaceutical industry and uh, um, the EMA, joining the inspection sector in September 2003. Anna became the head of the Clinical and Non-Clinical Compliance Service in 2009, with her service being involved in the implementation of the regulation and the development of CTIS. And she moved in the Clinical Studies and Manufacturing Task Force in March 2020, taking the role of CTIS Deputy Program Manager and, of course, CTIS Expert. So welcome to our three uh, panelists. Maybe we can take some of the questions that are raised now just to focus on the first part of the application on the form and part one before Melis and Olga um, guide us through the, the part two. So let's have a look at the question. Maybe just one that I can clarify because there was a question on the links uh, that some of you have received to have access to our test environment. If these will be the links for production, please consider that uh, the links for the production environment of CTIS will only be available from the 31st of January. So the links that have been shared in advance are just for testing purposes. Maybe we can take some questions and Anna, actually this would be to you as an expert in the user management and user administration area of the system. Um, maybe I can combine a couple of questions for you. Which uh, role creates the trial to get uh, the UCT number? And is the city admin and the sponsor admin the same? So what is the difference between these two roles? Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, good morning to everyone and uh, thank you, Laura, for the introduction and, and the questions. Uh, for the first um, uh, question, if uh, the user follow what we call the organization-centric approach, uh, meaning that has registered a sponsor administrator in, in IIM in the email account management system and has been validated by EMEA, then uh, the role required to create an application and therefore as the first step to generate the EU number is the city admin with the scope of all trials. If uh, the user follow what we call the city-centric approach, where in that case you don't need to have registered a sponsor administrator, then uh, with the default role that you inherit with your credentials, uh, you would be able um, to create an initial application and from that moment that user will become a city administrator, but uh, specifically for, for that trial. And, and regarding the second question, uh, uh, the sponsor admin is not the same as the city admin. The sponsor admin is purely uh, an administrator role uh, that can assign uh, roles to other users. Obviously, this role, this user with this role can uh, assign to himself or herself uh, business roles, but initially it does not have business permission. It's just purely an administrator, whereas a city admin, it has a double profile. In one side, it's an administrator, but at the same time, it has map the permission of all the business roles with the exception of the ASR um, a submitted role that uh, will be required on top if uh, they need to be involved in those activities. So uh, so it's more um, a super user uh, 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 depend, uh, the access will depend if the scope of that uh, city admin role is for a specific trial or is for all trial within the sponsor organization. Thank you very much, Anna. This is really, uh, really clear. And there is a question, if it's available an organigram of the roles. I, I guess the question is about where the, our future yes. users can have a look at the different roles and permissions. Yes. 
Yes, Laura, I think if uh, 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 colleagues look at the training material there, we have what we have, uh, what we call the summary of the role matrix. Uh, this is going to be um, uh, uh, uploaded a new version before go live with the, to reflect the latest changes. And on top, we are going to uh, upload a document that uh, cover all the sponsor business processes, uh, which detail the different steps of that processes and what are the roles that can perform each of those more in line what has been presented by Olga, for example, if you uh, who can uh, uh, when you start completing the form, which are the roles that can complete the form and even within the form who can put the proof of payment, who can put the uh, cover letter. So so this document is going to be uploaded in our as part of our training material before go live. Thank so you, you have all the information there. Thank you very much, yes, and please consult our um, website where we have already extended training material on all different modules in relation to sponsor functionalities and member states functionalities. There are e-learning, step-by-step uh, guide, uh, video clips of the system that will uh, help you in preparation of the use of CTIS. So thank you, Anna. Now, Rudiger, a few questions for you. Uh, the first one, uh, how long will a draft be available in the sponsor? to secure domain. There is a limited period of time or thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Laura, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, the uh, the answer is the information in, in the draft is available to the sponsor and there is no time out. So sponsors have the option to create a draft and submit it much later. Thank you very much, Rudiger. And a question that, of course, is related to the way of working of colleagues having access to CTIS. Can more than one person work on the application simultaneously? Again, the answer is yes. And any user that has a specific section locked by locking the padlock will prevent other users from accessing it. But there is no limitation that other users can work in other sections that are currently available and unlocked and lock them for editing. So multiple users can work simultaneously within one part even of the system. Indeed. So you have seen from the demo with, um, with Olga that, for example, in part one, we have three sections with three locks trial sponsor product if one of the colleagues is locking the section on product another colleague can work on the trial for example detailed section in part one for the part two you will see there are different member states each one with a lock of a section different uh, colleagues can work on different application for the member states thank you very much rudiger maybe the last one for you regarding the cover letter should just be one cover letter what happens to the country requirements for each cover letter thanks the cover letter is stipulated in the Regulation Annex 1 and also in the Regulation Annex 2, so there, there are clear legal rules what expectations are to be provided in the cover letter and in conjunction with the Article 26 that has been introduced that any country can provide the language requirements if any part of the application dossier, there is one cover letter and if one of the member states concerned in that trial requires the cover letter to be translated into local language, then this will need to be uploaded underneath the, let's say, English cover letter and uh, the corresponding translations will be added underneath. The information of what data and documents are required to be in specific local languages is stipulated by the European Commission in the Eutrodex Volume 10 question and answer document. There is an annex that provides the language details for certain data and documents in part one, and the cover letter is one of it. Thank you very much, Rudiger. And Marianne, um, one question for you on the member states' requirements for the proof of payment. Will this be needed for all the member states concerned? Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Laura, and good morning to everybody. Um, no, uh, I can already come up with an example. We in Austria will not uh, mandate a prepayment uh, we will have an invoice after the procedure because uh, our fees are influenced by many factors that cannot be uh, uh, known in advance. So we, we are going to uh, send an invoice, as I said. 
thank you. So indeed, these remain a national requirements for each uh, member state's concern. I think this was to get some of the questions for part one. Now um, we give the floor back to Olga and, and Melis for the part two of the dossier so that we complete the initial clinical trial application. Olga, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we just have the part two left to complete our application. So um, as we were seeing when we were adding the part one details, I would just quickly go back to the part one. As you remember, when we were filling in information for the trial details, we could add some translations of the fields that have been added in English uh, to the languages that um, are that belong to the to the member states concerned. That's for the for the part one where we can add the the translations, and in the part two. We will have the country specific details and we will have um, specific part two forms, let's say, for each of the member states concerned that we have entered. So in this case, remember that we have added two member states concerned, Denmark and Spain. So under our part two, we will see two entries, the part two for Denmark and the part two for Spain. So for each of the countries, we will be able to add the trial site information and uh, a set of documents that will be specific to that country in particular. As you can see, we also have our lock icon to allow different users to be working, for example, in on different part twos. I can be working on the part two for Spain and some other colleague can be working on the part two for, for Denmark. So I will be able to select the trial site and to upload some of the documents uh, that are um, required and also not required for its specific part to its, its specific country. So we will have the recruitment arrangements. For example, you'll see here that the, the document upload functionality and display is exactly the same as we could see in part one. And in fact, as we will see all throughout the application, we will see the document here uploaded with our um, options to edit, update, remove, or add new documents. In this case, the recruitment arrangements documents will be by default for publication. We also have the option to upload one additional detail, uh, one additional document, sorry, that will be not for publication. We have the subject information and informed consent form documents, the suitability of the investigator, where we can add uh, the, docu the document about the suitability, but also the investigator's CV, the suitability of the facilities, also required document. You will always be guided with your, uh, with your asterisk here. The proof of insurance cover or indemnification, the financial and other arrangements, the compliance with both the national requirements on data protection and with the use of biological samples. You will see here the difference where these two fields, for example, do not have an asterisk. So that would mean that we can uh, submit our clinical trial application without these uh, documents, we can decide whether to upload them in CTIS or not. And as we had for the part one, we have this all documents section where we have all the documents that we have uploaded listed here all together. And we have all the options to edit, update, remove, or add additional details, sorry, additional documents. So that will be for Spain. So it, once I have finished for Spain, I will click on my padlock again to complete the form and save the information. I will go to Denmark and I have exactly the same sections. I will click on the lock, see the trial sites, and you will see that I have the accordions for exactly the same section. So just to show you how the uh, check functionality will work, I will, for example, choose to delete the recruitment arrangements documents, which, as you can see, has an asterisk indicating that it's required. So I have deleted the document. There's no document here. I will save. And now I'm going to click on check. So as you can remember before, it was saying that the application was valid and complete. So if I now click on check, 
I will get a message here warning. In the part two, in the Denmark section, and the accordion will be highlighted in red to mark that there's something missing here. Some required information is missing. So I will need to click on the lock again, go to the accordion that is red. As you can see here, it stands out. So I will click here at the document that the system has kindly indicated that I'm missing. I will add the title. And as you can see, the document type by default will be for publication. Now my document has been uploaded, so I'm going to save again. I'm going to check now. And as you can see, the warning message has disappeared. I get the message that the application is valid and the recruitment arrangements section is no longer highlighted in red. So that would be it for our, for our part two as well. We have uh, filled in all the information that is necessary to submit our initial application section. We have two additional sections here uh, for the initial application, which are the evaluation and the timetable, which we will see in the next, uh, in the next demo for the assessment of the, of the initial application. So now we are ready to submit our initial application. We click on the Submit button. We will get a confirmation pop-up. We can select to submit the part twos. We confirm that we want to submit it. We will get here a summary of what we are going to, to submit, the summary of the products, the city number, the title, the primary sponsor, the summary also of the, of the member states concerned that we have added. And we have here the declaration that the sponsor has to agree to, that the information provided is complete, that the documents contain uh, the accurate information, that the trial is going to be conducted in accordance with the protocol and with the regulation. So we have to check on agree, otherwise the confirm option will not be available. So we need to agree to this declaration and we confirm the submission. We get a message informing us that the submission has been successful. And now, as you can see, we're back to the trial summary where the, the status has changed. So the trial summary will always display the status of the, of the trial. We can see that it has been changed from pending because it was still in draft to under evaluation. This means that the assessment process has started and it's ongoing for that specific trial. The proposed RMS is Denmark. We have the product information here in the trial summary, the different member states, uh, because the trial will have or may have different status uh, per member state. So we will see the summary here, also with the decision date and uh, trial recruitment notification status. And in, in the list of applications, we will see that our initial application containing part one and part two is under evaluation for both member states, Denmark and Spain, submitted on the 20th of January. And that's it for the sponsor part. We have submitted our application, so back to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Olga. And um, maybe before we move now to the authority um, workspace and the authority domain and we guide you through the steps for the evaluation, maybe we can also clarify some of the questions that were raised. There was one in relation to the form for compliance with the regulation. Uh, you have seen it in the form section, there is a statement of compliance with the GDPR. Just to mention that uh, there are some discussion on developing a template, a simple template that can be used then by the sponsor for the declaration of 
compliance with the GDPR principle. So yes, this is in, in the plan to, uh, to develop um, a template for, uh, for this section. Is possible to download a blank application from the system? Yes, once that you have created an initial application, if you have just the title there, you will be able to use the download functionality for the draft, and then you will see only the title information or whatever you have populated. So this is uh, supported in the system. There are some questions on local languages for the RFI, if English should be used. Some of these questions we might take uh, at the end of the meeting today when we have the panel discussion and also representative of the European Commission. So just to, to mention that we are going through the questions that you are raising and some of them, if not addressed now, will be addressed or we'll try to address most of them later on. Okay, without further ado, then uh, moving on, on the evaluation uh, phase, uh, we have just a few slides to remind all of us of the steps for the evaluation of an application. Thank you very much. The first step is the validation. And as you know, this is 10 calendar days as stipulated in the regulation is also the time when the RMS is selected. So in case of a multinational clinical trials, we need to have a member states in the lead that is appointed by day six. The validation includes also the possibility to document consideration is really the administrative review of the dossier to be sure that everything is in order before the assessment starts and the RMS in that case will be able to raise an RFI. Raising an RFI at the time of validation will extend the timelines of 15 days with maximum 10 days for the sponsor to respond and five days for the evaluation of the responses. Once the validation is concluded and the outcome documented in the system, we then now move to the assessment in the next slide of the part one and the part two. Thank you, thank you. And uh, we have the assessment of part one and the assessment of part two that is done in parallel uh, when a full dossier um, application is submitted to the member states. The assessment of part one is done by the, by the RMS. The assessment of part two is done by each individual member states. Um, they take 45 minutes, um, 45 days, sorry, and also in this case is possible to raise uh, an RFI that will extend the timelines to uh, 31 days. Um, uh, so RFI 12 days for the sponsor to reply and overall extension of uh, 31 days, including the member states assessment. Once that we have the documented conclusion on part one and the documented conclusion on part two, we can then move to the last uh, step for the evaluation that is about the decision. Thank you very much. So the decision is five days since uh, both the conclusion on part one and part two are documented in the system. It's still uh, a pertinence, a matter of each member state's concern to issue a decision on the authorization of the trial or not. And this is, will, uh, is based on the conclusion on part one and part two. So this is a really fast overview. Now um, Olga and Melis will guide you through more in details on how this is implemented in the system. I think we have one slide on the RMS. Um, Melis, I'll give you the floor, thank you. Thank you, Laura. So uh, we've just seen the initial application submission uh, where our sponsor has added two member states. In our case, uh, Denmark and Spain. Now uh, our MSCs needs to express their willingness uh, to be a RMS. So uh, for the RMS selection process, we have some uh, couple of scenarios where we can encounter in the system. Today, uh, in the demo, we will only do the quickest and simpl uh, simplest scenario, but I will explain you uh, the other scenarios in this uh, slide. So now, um, after the application submission, we have now uh, the express willingness and unwillingness task generated in the system for the MSC users. Uh, from day zero to day three, uh, the MSCs can express willingness once. After uh, they complete the uh, expressing their willingness, if we have only one MSC go willing and the rest says uh, unwilling, then uh, this is the quickest scenario. Uh, the willing MSC will be our RMS. Uh, in the second scenario, uh, where we can have more than one MSC says willing, uh, then we need to uh, the 
our MSCs needs to be aligned on uh, who is going to be the RMS. So in that case, uh, the system will generate another task, which is called agree RMS task. Uh, in this task, uh, the assigner uh, MSC will select the candidate RMS from the pool of willing. Then we will have the our RMS selected. Uh, another uh, scenario we might have, uh, none of the MSCs says willing, uh, all of them uh, goes unwilling. Uh, in this case, the system will generate re-express re willingness and agree RMS task. So uh, in this task, our MSCs needs to re-express re willingness for all member states uh, until day five. Then uh, the assigner uh, selects the RMS from pool of willing. And uh, in that task also, we have a, a discussion forum where our MSCs can uh, share their comments regarding the uh, re-express willingness and agree RMS task. Now I will go through the system and uh, we will select our RMS. So this was the sponsor. I will just open the member state. I will log out from sponsor. I will log in with Denmark uh, to play first. So now uh, I am on the task tab. Uh, we, uh, as we mentioned before, we have some uh, multiple tabs here uh, to help uh, the member states to, to our users uh, to help to manage their uh, tasks. So here for uh, our clinical trial, I just need to write in the search. By searching with the clinical trial, now I am able to see the task that I need to go through. Here, now, uh, as we mentioned, express willingness and unwillingness task is generated, and we have also uh, document consideration for validation task. Uh, in the task tab, in the system for the task, we have two concepts, uh, soft task and hard tasks. So uh, you can see from the color also for the hard task, we have this gray color, where for the soft task, we have this yellowish color. Uh, hard task means that uh, we need to complete the hard tasks uh, by manually to assign to ourselves to advance the floor. For the soft task, we don't need to uh, complete them by manually uh, to advance the flow. Uh, they will be completed automatically uh, if the dependent task is completed. So to select uh, RMS, now I will uh, assign to express willingness and unwillingness task to myself. Here, uh, a new screen has opened to me. Now the Denmark is also proposed RMS. Uh, while the sponsor creates the application, uh, my colleague Olga select Denmark as a proposed RMS, so we can see it from banner also. So by clicking the pending, then uh, now I have this small pop-up here where I can uh, express my willingness. I will say Denmark is willing. I will share and I will complete the task. Now I need to uh, log into system with Spain uh, to do the same uh, expression. In this case, we are uh, using one computer. So for this reason, I'm actually opening the same uh, system again from incognito mode. Now I log into system with uh, credentials of Spain. So I will do exactly the same steps. I am in the task. Here uh, I can see the express willingness, unwillingness task for our clinical trial numbers. I will just assign to myself. Now uh, to do the quickest scenario for Spain, uh, I will go unwilling, then our uh, RMS will be Denmark. I will complete and confirm. So now I am in the same page that we saw earlier, uh, the summary top here. Uh, our RMS, before it was proposed RMS, was Denmark. Now we can see that our RMS has been selected and it is Denmark here. 
If I go inside of the application, here also I can see that the Denmark is RMS. Now I will switch to Denmark to do RMS tasks. Now I'm in Denmark. Now uh, to conclude to validation and uh, advance the flow with part one and part two assessments, I need to complete the uh, validation assessment. Here I have hard task again, uh, which is in gray. To be able to conclude, I need to assign it to myself, to RMS. Here again, I am in the task screen, so I can either select for the dossier in, uh, complete, either complete or incomplete, I will say complete in our case. The scope can be in scope or out of scope. So I will complete the validation. Now, after completing the submit validation decision, uh, our task status has been changed to completed. Before it was pending and it was in uh, orange, now it is in green. I will go again to the summary page and to open the application. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, in the sponsor workspace, we, on the left we have these tabs form, MSC, part one, part two, evaluation and timetable. I will click evaluation to go through the uh, phases. So here we can see the first uh, process that we completed is the RMS selection. Uh, this is exactly the same screen we saw in the task. Then we have the validation here. We have the conclusion accordion where we can see the, our conclusion, which is valid. Our dossier is complete and the validation date uh, is the today's day. Now for the part one, uh, I will create some considerations uh, and then we will submit RFI to our sponsor for part one. Uh, then uh, we will submit RFI, our sponsor will respond to RFI and then we will uh, continue with the part one. So here in the part one, I have two tabs, all considerations and consolidated considerations. Considerations. To create a consideration, we have the uh, new button here. So by uh, clicking new button, then for the application section, we can see the sections and documents where we can raise the RFI uh, for, the, for this application. They are, um, Part one sections, IMPD quality, justification, law intervention, we've seen before product details and proof of payment. So I will select proof of payment. I will select the type of the consideration. So in this case, non-clinical. And I will write the title is consideration one. I can create one more. So in this case, let's select IMPD quality, which is the type of the, uh, which is quality type of consideration. Consideration two, save. Now I will share these uh, considerations with other member states by selecting from the checkbox. I just shared. Now the shared on the date uh, has been populated here. We have the date that we shared the considerations. Now I have some options. Either I can actually change my mind and say, okay, this is not included. I can merge these two to one consideration or I can accept. So I will accept those considerations. Here RMS has a chance to write some comments. Consideration comments for each of them. I will just do one. Now my considerations has been moved to the consolidated considerations tab. From here, I will share them again with the member states. Now I have the consolidation date. Now I will create my RFI. In uh, RFI pop-up, after we click the create RFI, we can see that there's a due date. So the member states have um, 12 days uh, to reply the RFI. 
uh, in their due dates. If the sponsor uh, does not respond to RFI, uh, this application will lapse because this is the assessment part one. So we can select the dates here. Um, the dates uh, does not fall on the weekend, so we can uh, only select the weekdays. I will select the 26. Now we have an option again here to upload a document for quality and non-quality. I will just upload some test documents. And non-quality. Now with these documents, I am able to submit the RFI. So we have submitted RFI. We have the green banner says RFI submitted successfully. Uh, now I will hand over to my colleague Olga to act on the RFI as a sponsor. Yes, so the sponsor in this case is sitting next to you. So I will be doing the sponsor part uh, and I will be replying to this RFI that I have just received. So uh, let me log out from the authority workspace and go back to the to the sponsor workspace. Okay. So um, in the sponsor workspace, uh, we do not have these tasks screen similar to what we have in the authority workspace. As, uh, as Melis was explaining, the authority users will have this task screen um, in order for them to organize their work. So the sponsors will not have these tasks as they are not acting on the, on the assessment, but they also have a tool to the, to organize their workload and know um, the, the upcoming events and actions related to their work, which is the notices and alerts section. Just to point out, the notices and alerts section is also available in the, in the authority workspace, but since the, the authority workspace has the tasks, um, they will have both tools. But in the sponsor, the notices and alerts section is especially important because here they will receive uh, any information related to their clinical trials that are in progress. And this will allow us to, to they will allow the sponsors to um, manage their workload um, with the specific timelines. Because as you can see here, for example, now we have uh, received some new notices and alerts uh, about the clinical trial that we have just created. Just to quickly show you, we have the application submitted notice, the RMS selected notice. This is the kind of information that the sponsor will be receiving so that they know how um, their clinical trial is progressing. Uh, they will also receive a, a notice when the validation conclusion is recorded. And now here we have a new alert. It's um, just indicating that the, the, the RMS has sent an RFI to the sponsor. You will see here that we have notices and alerts. There are two different types of messages. The notices will be just informing the user that some action has been has been taken. They, they will just give information and the alerts will be uh, giving this information as well, but they will be somehow requiring an action uh, from the sponsor in this case. So we have received this alert um, informing the sponsor that an RFI has been sent in the part one. Um, we will see here all the, the necessary information at, the, at one glance about the clinical trial uh, number, the, um, the, the type of application in this case, which is initial application, also the evaluation process, which would be assessed part one, the date where this alert has been received, the relevant products, the RMS for that trial, and the sponsor. So if we click on the alert, we will be redirected to the evaluation section uh, in, the, in our initial application, assessment part one. 
section RFIs. As you can see, the sponsor will not have visibility on the consideration section, as we have seen for the for the authority. They can just see the RFI. And just as a as a quick note, um, the sponsor will also have a dedicated section for RFIs. So I'll just quickly show it to you. We have this RFI section where they have the similar layout that we have been seeing in other screens. We also have a search, basic and advanced search so that they can locate quickly their RFIs. And we have a list here of all the RFIs that are um, existing in the system for the relevant clinical trials. So in this case, for example, we have our RFI. This is our clinical trial number. The MSC that has that has sent this RFI is Denmark, initial application, assess part one. We have the submitted date and the due date for that RFI. We see that it's pending. And we also see information about the trial. So we can also click here directly. So the, the, the sponsor will have several different ways to access an RFI, both uh, from the notices and alert section and also from the RFI screen, but also they can access directly through the clinical trial. They always have that option as well. So if we click here on the RFI, we will be also redirected to our initial application, evaluation section, and part one. So we see here our RFI. We can see again our uh, logs here. Uh, for the RFIs, we will have two different logs. We will have one general log just to log the, the whole RFI. And we also see specific logs for each of the considerations. So we can have the, the general RFI logged, uh, but not the considerations, and uh, we can just quickly lock each of the considerations individually uh, to work on the on the response. So this will be like the general information about the RFI. We will see the documents that this, that the member state has uploaded. And we also have uh, the possibility to upload some response documents. And we have the change application uh, option here. So uh, as a result of a request for information, the sponsor can edit the information that they have submitted in the application in case that the, the, the member states concerned asks for it. So we will click on change application. We will create a new draft version of this application. So this draft version is created on top of the submitted uh, version of the initial application. And we have this blue banner here on top that will help us know uh, where we are. We are working on a, on a new version draft for this RFI. The, the RFI ID is, uh, you see, a, a bit long, but it's um, actually composed of the CT number, the type of application, in this case, initial, and the number, the, the sequence number of the, of the RFI is the first one, so that is why we have uh, 001. We can also change and go back to the submitted application in, one, in case we want to compare the, the two applications. And you will see that the view is very, very similar, actually the same as we had when we were editing the initial application for submission. We have the buttons here, text, save, uh, withdrawn copy. And we also have the sections here, form, MSCs, part one and part two. It's very important to note that this is a part one RFI, which means that we will only be able to edit the part one. We will be able to see all the information in the initial application, but we will only be able to edit and update the information of the part one. And that is why you see that in the part one, we have all the logs that we saw when we submitted it, that we can click on the logs. You'll see that, for example, trial identifiers. It's read-only because we have not clicked the log yet. But if we click on the log, we will see that this is enabled. So I will just uh, write um, that the title has been changed in an RFI. Okay, so now that the RFI, that the title has been changed, I will click on the lock and save. And uh, you see that 
this highlight is appearing, which means that uh, there's a change there. This uh, yellow uh, bar line will allow us to see what has been changed uh, in the in the new version. So that way, um, the the users will see what has been changed and what has not been changed. Also, we have this blue dot here indicating that there were changes done in the part one. If we go to the part two, on the contrary, we will see that there is no lock at all. We can see the part twos, we can see Denmark, we can see the details, the information is uh, available, but we don't have a lock icon, so we cannot edit anything at all. So we have already edited our part one. So let's now respond to the RFI. We have done the changes um, as part of the RFI. So now we go back to the evaluation section. We go to the RFI. We lock it again. Okay, we see that the, the button that was previously change application has changed to discard changes in case we we want to remove them altogether and remove the draft version that we have created. And since we have added some application changes, we need to add mandatorily, we have the asterisk here, a document that will describe the changes that we have been done. So apart from the highlight of changes, we will have this, this document. So I have here changes to the application, RFI part one. I will attach it. And I will now respond to the consideration. So I have one consideration. I will lock it at the response. Okay. I can save my response. And then I will go and respond to the second one. Okay. I can also add some supporting documents if needed. document here. We can save the response. And now with it, that we have submitted the response, we have responded to both of the considerations, we can submit our response. So after we confirm the submission, the RFI will change its status from pending to responded and we can go back to the authority. Thank you, Olga. So back on authority, I will just log out from sponsor workspace and log into member state. So with the credentials of Denmark, <coughs> I log into system. As explained, uh, by Olga, now we can see in the notice alert stop response to RFI has been submitted from our sponsor uh, with the, our clinical trial number here. So by clicking the alert, I will be redirected to RFI page. Here also our RFI status has been changed to responded. It was pending before. Now I am able to see the documents. Uh, that uploaded by sponsor changes to the application RFI part one here. The documents were uploaded by member state while creating the RM, uh, while creating the RFI, so they are also here. And the considerations. So here we can see the response of the sponsor. And for the next consideration, also exactly the same, the sponsor re response and the documents related to the response. So here I am able to assess the RFI by uh, share, adding my comments and then I will share my comments within the uh, other member states. So, uh, thank you. After clicking the share comment, we can see the comment by Denmark here with the uh, date of the comment. I am able to assess the another uh, the next consideration here. All good. And share comments. So I just want to go back to Spain to our um, another MSC. I just switched the uh, window 
now here I log in with Spain. Exactly the same alert here, response to RFI submitted, I've just received, so I will click. <coughs> now I am in the assessment part one, uh, the same uh, accordions here, RFI status change to responded, the same documents I can see, changes to the application, the uh, response of the consideration, sponsor response, and now I'm able to see uh, the comment by Denmark. Now with Spain, I will assess the RFI. Spain commented. For the next consideration here also I can see the response and the documents related to response and again uh, the comment by Denmark. So I will assess the second consideration as well. Thank you and I will share the comments. Now back again in the tasks. <clears throat> so now in the part one, uh, we can see our soft tasks here, SSRFI response, um, document consideration SS part one. So here also I can use the advanced search by clicking, uh, by selecting the application type. And in this case, I want to only see the part one assessment process and with our clinical trial number. Now I can see the document consideration SS part one soft task here and also the SSRFI response. So I will just go back to the RMS. We'll do the same steps here. Assessment part one. From the RMS side, we can see uh, the submit RFI task also generated in the system, consolidate considerations and circulate draft assessment part one report. So uh, after the validation, we have 26 days here uh, to complete the circulate draft assessment part one report. And also uh, for the document consideration, we have 38 days and for the submit RFI, we have 45 days before uh, from the validation. So I will just upload one draft assessment report. Now uh, under the assessment part one, I have the draft assessment report section here. I will just lock it. So here we have seven slots for the draft assessment report, part one section one introduction, uh, two quality assessment draft, three preclinical assessment draft. So here, uh, seven draft um, document type. What can I do here? I can uh, generate a template for the, um, for the documents that I've selected. So here, if I select these three and then I click the generate template, then uh, I will have the, let's say a law, I will have the uh, templates uh, downloaded in my computer. For the demo purposes, I will just only upload one draft assessment report. And I will attach. So here, after I upload this document, I am able to share with other member states. Then it will ask my confirmation. It will be shared to all member states. So I confirm. Now we have uh, populated the system version, shared date and the version one. Now I will go back to the tasks to advance the flow with the part one. Here we have the submit part one conclusion task already generated. Uh, you can see that it is gray, so it is a hard task that I need to complete it. So I will assign to myself to RMS I will log it again here. So here I am able to see the draft documents that I uploaded from uh, application. This is the uh, same screen we just saw in the um, application itself. Now to conclude the part one, uh, I need to upload final documents. So final part one assessment report quality and accept quality documents. So I will just upload two test documents here.
Art on Assessment Quality. And this is for Accept Quality. And this document will be publicly available. Assessment Accept Quality. Here also I have this functionality where I can uh, share my comments, uh, discussion within the MSC. So Denmark is able to make some comments here and then share with the uh, other MSCs. So I will just conclude my decision for part one. I will say acceptable part one and I will submit it. Now back again in the tasks. So I will just quickly show you the status of the tasks now. I just need to write, yeah. This was for the pending tasks, so we don't have any pending tasks uh, for our clinical trial, so that's why we didn't see any tasks. Now for the part one tasks, as we just complete our part one, uh, they are all in completed status. I will just quickly show you the timetable because we didn't mention about it. So it's also inside of the application. We have the timetable section where you can see the tasks now uh, for validation and for part one, they are all in completed status. Document consideration RFI completed, submit RFI completed, and the conclusion is completed. Now I'm going back to the evaluation. We have part two now, so I will only create one consideration for part two and then we'll, we will quickly submit RFI for part two. <laughs> so uh, it is the same as we've seen in part one, the considerations, all considerations and consolidated considerations tab. I will click the application section that's and the consideration comment. So these are the sections related to part two at now this time. I will share it. Now the share on date is populated. I will accept the consideration. I am able to make a comment here. I will share and now I will up create an RFI. So again, we have the due date here. Uh, again, the sponsor has 12 days to respond. Uh, if they don't respond at time, then this application will lapse for the MSC that we have created the RFI. So since it is part two, uh, only uh, application will be lapsed only for this specific MSC. Now submit. RFI submitted successfully. Now we are back again in sponsor to respond to RFI. Yes, sponsor is here. <laughs> so I will uh, do it uh, quickly uh, because it's basically the same process uh, as we did for uh, for part one. So yes, let's change. Thank you <laughs> for um, let's change to sponsor workspace. Let's log in with our sponsor user. And before we uh, access the RFI from the RFI section, now we are going to do it from the notices and alerts. So I have received another alert about the RFI sent to sponsor in this case for the part two. So I'll just click on the notice. I'm redirected to the evaluation section part two. Uh, in this case, I can see the two sections, one for Denmark and one for Spain. I can see the RFI that is due on the 1st of February. I still have this uh, locks here and in this case if I click on the change application button just to quickly show you what I will be able to do. I'm redirected to the part two for Denmark. I have my lock icon. I can change. If I click on the lock. But on the contrary, if I go to the part two from Spain, I will not see the lock. So I will only be able to make changes in the part two 
related to the RFI that I am responding to. The same way that if I go to the part one, I will not have the logs either. So I will not be able to change anything. I will still see my highlighted change from the RFI in, in the part one, but I will not be able to do any changes. So in this case, I'm not going to do any change in the application. I'll just go to the evaluation, RFI, lock icon. I will discard any changes that I have made, discard the, the draft. So I will directly respond the RFI without changing the application. I will lock. I will respond to the consideration. Thank you. Save the response and submit the response. And we're back to the authority. Thank you, Olga. So I will log out from sponsor. And we'll switch to member state. Log in with Denmark credentials. So now from uh, notice alerts, we are able to see that the sponsor responds to, uh, responded to RFI for assessment part two. So I will click the alert here again. Now the RFI status has been changed to responded. We can see it's in green now. And the response here, our sponsor response, we are able to see the response. And again, uh, we are able to assess the RFI. So I will just thank to my colleague here. Now back on the tasks. So we uh, assess the RFI now uh, to continue with the authorization of the application. I will conclude the part two from Denmark and also from Spain. So now uh, I'm still in the uh, RMS site, so I will assign it to myself, the part two conclusion. Here we have only one draft document and one final uh, part two assessment report. Uh, on the final is mandatory to upload here to conclude the part two task, part two conclusion task. So I will upload one, part two final, Inside Denmark. <coughs> Again, I have the discussion functionality here. I can share my comments. Now I will select the conclusion as acceptable and submit the part two. So here back on the task tab, we can see that authorized task has been generated. Now we have the five days uh, from the completion of the submit part two. Now I will switch to Spain. We'll do the same steps. Here again in Spain, the member states. Just window. So now from Spain side, it is the same. We have the part two conclusion task generated. So I will conclude the part two for Spain. The screen is the same. Part two assessment report draft I can upload and uh, part two assessment report final, which is mandatory that I need to upload here. Just to test. Part two final, Spain. And the final conclusion, I will say also acceptable and submit. Now we are back on the task tab. Uh, only task pending is authorized. So we can just quickly check our timetable. From left hand side here, the timetable, we can see that all the tasks are now in completed status. Only pending task is the submit decision, which is the authorized task. So I will go back to task tab. I will assign to myself to authorize task. Here we can see the part one conclusion is acceptable. Part two conclusion is acceptable. Uh, this is from Spain. So I will select the decision from Spain. I will say authorize. 
Here also uh, we can see the deferrals set by sponsor when uh, submitting the application. So here the uh, member state users are able to um, do some updates on the dates. So I can delete this two and say one because uh, I cannot exceed what uh, my colleague sponsor uh, set here. So I will just select uh, say one for the assessment reports and I will complete the authorization task. Now from the clinical trial stop, we can check our trial. Now, uh, first MSC has decided on the application. So here we can see that the under evaluation changed to authorize. Also for Spain, uh, the MSC trial status is authorized. So now, uh, to finish the decision, I will do the authorization from Denmark. Now I switch to Denmark here on the task stop, authorize. I will assign to myself. I can see the part one conclusion is acceptable, part two conclusion is acceptable, and the decision I will select authorize. And the same deferrals here set by sponsor. Again, Denmark user is able to change the um, values here and I can set uh, for the six months, let's say four months. And I will complete the task. Now also in the notice alert, we have this notice that says the decision submitted. So Denmark has submitted a decision of authorize on the initial. Now our status is changed to authorize. In the summary page, also now for Denmark, the MSC trial status is authorized. So with these all steps, uh, we've just concluded our initial application. Uh, we have decided and uh, the status is now authorized. Um, so now I will give back the floor to my colleague Laura here. Thank you very much, Melis and Olga. I think it was very detailed demonstration of uh, the functionalities in the sponsor and in the authority domain to go through the flow, issue the decision, issue the conclusion on part one, part two, and um, the decision at the end. So we are taking notes of some of the questions that you are raising in relation to the access to the sandbox of what happens if the system is down in terms of timelines. All these questions or the others that you are raising, remember that we have a QA a session starting at 4.30, so these more general questions will be uh, taken later on. Now let's focus more on the system functionalities and I'll go back now to the three uh, expert panelists that we have. Um, maybe um, just to clarify, there was a question on when the RMS selection takes place. Let's remember that this is taking place in the first uh, six days since the application is submitted. Um, there are six days to select the RMS during this uh, 10 uh, days initial period. Uh, maybe Marianne, a quest for you. Uh, if a member states declare that they are unwilling and then they have the possibility to um, re-express their willingness or unwillingness a second time, what happens after six days if no member states concerned has declared that is willing to become the RMS? Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, this is the reason why we have the proposed RMS. Uh, if we need a fallback member state to take over the responsibility, and this would be exactly in this situation where no member state is willing until day six, then the proposed RMS will be the RMS. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. Uh, Anna, a question for you. Will the sponsor receive an email notifying them that an RFI has been received in CTIS? Sorry, I apologize. Yes, no, the CTIS will not work with emails. The only exception is when a user is assigned with a role, and then in that case, the user will receive a, a, an email, inform them of the role. But for the rest, you will have to use the notice and alerts. And in particular, for the RFI, obviously, you will have an alert once the member state or the RMS submit uh, an RFI. You also will have alerts to remind you that you have to 
to reply to the RFI that the due date is, is um, approaching. And also, once you reply to the RFI, there will be also another alert to inform that the RFI has been uh, submitted by, by the sponsor. So, so you have to use the notice and alert that uh, Olga has uh, presented to you during the demo. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. And um, Rudiger, a question for you. Is it possible for the sponsor to change or withdraw investigator site details after receiving the RFI because the request cannot be fulfilled? So how the modification of the dossier works in relation to the RFI and after the RFI are raised? Thank you, Rudiger. Yes, thank you. It is possible to actually remove and uh, delete documents that have been submitted from the actual dossier. That doesn't mean they are removed entirely from the database because they were once submitted and have obviously been put into the database at the time of submission. So it is always possible to go back to a previous version of the application and find the information there. Now, if, and that is in relation to this question here, if it is found deemed by the sponsor that it is not possible to sufficiently provide acceptance for a specific investigator or trial site, then sponsors as part of this RFI response can actually remove that information and remove the trial site and the investigator details, including the documents for the application under evaluation in order to proceed so that member states can then have a final positive conclusion on the part two. Very clear. Thank you, Rudiger. Marianne, another question for you. For part two, um, some ethics committee have previously uh, had national requirements about receiving a draft in case of case report form, but in the CTIS, there is no placeholder for such documents. Does, does it mean that they are no longer needed? Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Those are always the difficult questions. I'm not very happy to answer in the name of other member states. But as a general rule, I, I can say that um, I, the, the clinical trial regulation uh, clearly describes what kind of uh, documents are needed. And uh, as you can see, uh, the, the CTIS is, is in a way translating the clinical trial regulation into an IT tool. So I think we should respect the slots that are created in CTIS and, and make use of those. Uh, but I think we will have a more extensive discussion on this matter at the end of the meeting. Indeed. Thank you, Marianne. We will have also other colleagues joining us for the uh, final Q&A session, and we can touch upon this point later on. Maybe before we conclude for a, for a coffee break, uh, uh, Anna, one question for you in relation to the RFI. We got several questions on the RFI. Is it possible to receive more than one RFI per application, an RFI for part one and multiple RFI for part two, uh, how this will work, and um, what sponsor role can see the RFI received for part one and part two, and what sponsor roles can work on it and submit the responses. If you can give us an overview on, on this and address the points. Thanks. Now yeah, I will start with the last one with regards to the, the roles. Uh, just to clarify, the, the city admin role as well as the application submitter roles have uh, uh, the possibility to view to create and to submit the RFI. But in the case of the application submitter, they will not be able uh, to specifically uh, um, uh, create a response for those considerations related to quality because they don't have the permission to view those quality related considerations. Then if we move to the other roles that are the um, preparer roles, as the name indicates, the preparer can only view and prepare uh, the, the response. And obviously what the access they will have will depends on, on, on the role. If you are a part one prepared excluding quality, you will be able to prepare the response with regards to the considerations uh, that does not involve uh, quality. If you are a um, quality IMPD preparer, uh, again, they will be able to prepare considerations uh, specifically uh, related to, to quality and address uh, those. And if you are a um, part two preparer, then you can address those considerations related uh, uh, to, to part two. But as I said, they can only prepare, they cannot 
uh, submit uh, uh, the RFI with the responses to the different questions from, from the member state because they are only preparers. So, and then I think with regards to the, the RFI, I think the best practice are indicated in the regulation. Uh, there, uh, um, it is possible, uh, it's expected that there will be only one RFI that's, uh, um, and hopefully no more than that, but there could be situations that uh, additional ones might be needed. And, 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 and the system is built in a way that it uh, gives that possibility. And the RFI is, uh, for example, in the assessment phase, you will receive an RFI in relation to part one and a different RFIs to, in relation to, to part two, because I think that's what uh, you wanted to understand. So there will not be an RFI that will combine both parts. So they will be separated RFIs and, and because also different roles uh, we'll have to address those RFI, uh, as I explained. For example, part two preparer will be responsible to address those questions uh, in relation to part two RFI, where part one uh, preparer will address those in relation to, to part one. So I don't know if colleagues, uh, uh, Rudiger, and as uh, representing the sponsor, wants to complement to, and Marianne as well, to, to my response. Just to add, perhaps on the on the question for the part two, Anan, you have nicely um, explained that part one and part two in the assessment will be different. And indeed, in part two, the RFIs for each member state concerned will be separate RFIs. So for each member state, there will not be one consolidated RFI for all member states concerned in the assessment. The only exclusion or the only exception where there will be a combination of considerations related to part one and any member states part two is in the validation phase as the validation does not foresee a separated segregated RFI all those considerations will be routed via the reporting member state via the validation RFI and those could include questions related to or considerations related to part one and any country member state part two. So that's the only exception. And it's, as already stated, the best practice is not to have more than one RFI. There could be perhaps follow up RFIs in, if, if exceptionally needed. And also it is not as, as an expected recommendation from a, from a best practice that uh, RFIs should be overlapping on the same part, especially if these may include changes to that part, then it will be challenging because the change to the dossier can only be assigned and associated to one of these RFIs, and it is not possible to have more than one draft in, in, in uh, of the application uh, created. So that's just as the addition here from the system functionality in relation to the practical implementation of of using RFIs and and to prevent that these are overlapping. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, sorry. Ah, Maria, <laughs> Laura. please go ahead. Yeah, I, I would sure. like to, to add the member state perspective, if I may, on, on, on this uh, question. Uh, it is clear that uh, our best practice guidance foresees that we will consolidate the list of questions and you will only receive one part one RFI at a time. There may be, in exceptional cases, situations where the question has not been completely clarified or not sufficiently clearly answered. Then, and if there is still enough time, we could come up with a, a short uh, subsequent, subsequent question if there is still time to, to do that. But you should not be afraid of, of member states approaching you with uh, a multiple number of, of part one RFIs uh, to, to assure you. Thank you, Marianne. And indeed, this was a very important addition and clarification. Thank you to the three panelists for the contribution to this question. Marianne, maybe if we can stay with you for a second before we move to the coffee break about the language, because we got some questions, but of course we can continue then maybe the discussion on this point at the end of the meeting. Just to briefly touch about the fact that the RFI and the responses might be in English, or if there will be requirements from the member states in the local language, if you can comment just a little bit on that and then maybe we can expand that at the session at 4.30. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. 
also here, uh, I would like to say I can only give an insight on, on our national concept. It's not really possible to answer for other member states. For us, we took the decision that it could might it, it might well be that uh, as, as a part of a request, there could be uh, national language aspects if we are is directly referring to a document in the national language. Then, of course, it would be more practical to post the, 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 the question already containing what you are expecting in response. Uh, the communication part of the questions, I think, it would be more practical to have it in, in English since everyone is able to understand it. I think the main idea of a collaboration is that everybody is, is able to understand questions and responses. So I think the, um, the local language requirements, at least to our point of view, should be reduced to a minimum in order to allow this collaboration and, and um, make everything transparent to everyone. Thank you very much. I think now is time for a coffee break. Um, please, colleagues, the ones that have joined uh, a little bit later on in this slide, you have the, the um, QR code to use Slido. You can see how to access Slido is the platform for raising the questions today. So in this slide, you have all the details. Maybe we can break now for uh, 10 minutes and uh, meet again at a quarter to 12. And then we will continue with the modifications. Uh, thank you very much and we speak in 10 minutes. So welcome back. I think we are ready to start for the next uh, session. It is about modifications. Maybe um, we can put this slide, I think is still make you, sorry if we go one back, just to emphasize again Slido, thank you. Now just to say in Slido, I think uh, colleagues have cleared the, um, some of the questions that were raised in the previous uh, session. We have taken notes of some that will be addressed at the end of the day. Please vote <laughs> your uh, favorite questions, the, one, um, the ones that you think would be good to address now, and we will try to keep track. So now if you see less questions, it's because some have been deleted. So moving on now to the modifications, thank you very much. And the next one, what you will see uh, in the next one hour or so is uh, a description of the changes of the modification that uh, a sponsor user can apply to uh, an application. So we will guide you through the submission of substantial modifications. Um, let's remember that uh, there are three types of substantial modification. The one uh, addressed to part one only, or the one referred to part two only, and the uh, SM covering in the scope part one and part two. Then we will cover the, the changes applied uh, via non-substantial modifications. Uh, I think there were a couple of questions in the chat um, raised already about this. This is about Article 819 uh, changes that are um, still relevant for the supervision but do not have an impact on the benefit risk assessment and therefore are not uh, assessed by the member states concerned. And then the last type of modification is about new uh, member states concerned. This is to expand the scope, the territorial scope of the trial, adding new uh, member states concerned. And in this case, what the sponsor can do is to add uh, translations of uh, structured data and documents in the language of the newly added member states. Can we go to the next uh, slide? Thank you. So in this slide, you can see uh, with this color coding of, of green and uh, other fields that are in, in uh, white color, what you can change as a sponsor user um, via substantial modification. So with substantial modification, you can basically modify uh, almost, uh, almost every field uh, in the clinical uh, trial dossier. You will have to provide a cover letter in the form section 
The modification description is a mandatory document for the sponsor to complete to explain what has been modified with the SEM. Uh, there is a possibility to provide supporting information and then we have detailed structured data in the system for you as a sponsor to explain the reason of the substantial modification and the scope. So if this covers part one only documents, part two only documents or both of them. And again the proof of payment uh, fee for which there are national requirements as we have heard before. The deferral section as you can see is not in green because it's not possible um, to modify that section with the version of the system that we will have. The deferral uh, section is not uh, changeable with the substantial modification. So this means that the deferral timelines that have been uh, set at the time of the initial applications are the ones that will stay uh, during the trial life cycle. Then there is this, uh, the, the section on member states concern. There you can modify the number of subjects per member states concern, but uh, for example, you cannot add a new member states concern. This is not possible with an SM. And why? Because we have a dedicated application type for the addition of a member state's concern. Then part one documents, you can see, you can modify uh, the data, um, the structured data, the translation, the details of the third parties, if there are zero taking part to the trials, contact details of the sponsor, product related documentation, um, details on the trials, this can be modified, as well as the part two documents including trial side details, PI contact details, and the documentation. So this is really to give you a high-level overview, but then Melissa and Olga will show you better in the system. In the next slide, we have the non-SM. Uh, in the non-SM, you can see that the green uh, part is much more limited, and this is because we have business rules implemented in the system that basically will guide you on what can be modified in the dossier with an SM or with a non-SM. So in the, uh, in the case of the non-SM, you can provide a modification description, um, you can modify the, the number of subjects uh, um, per member state's concern, you can modify some of the data and some of the documents, uh, but of course uh, all the documentation that can have an impact on the benefit risk profile, there, there are limitations because the non-SM are not assessed by the member state. So of course there are restrictions imposed on the number of fields that can be modified with a non-SM. And then moving on to the uh, third slide, it is about the addition of a member state's concern. Addition of a new member state's concern is all about, let's say, the population of the part two for that member state's concern, because you will have to uh, provide the details of the site, the details of the principal investigator, the recruitment arrangement, and the only thing as a sponsor that you can do when you add a new member state's concern in relation to part one is to provide translations. So if there are requirements from the newly added member state's concern to have the language, uh, the, the, the documents in the part one in their language, like the protocol, study uh, design related or product related, any documentation that sits in the, in the part one, uh, or also the update on structured data, this, uh, this is possible with the addition of a new MSC. It's only possible to provide translations. You cannot provide new documents or new information on the part one because of course the part one has already been assessed and a conclusion has been issued. Now the last slide I think uh, is more about the evaluation phase, the assessment phase. Um, this is what is uh, stipulated of course in the regulation for SM part one, uh, part one only, part two only or SM part one and part two. There is always you see a validation phase with specific timelines uh, stipulated in the regulation. Then there is the assessment of the part, assessment of part one only or part two only, or both of them, depends on the scope. And then there is always the step of the decision that needs to be taken by the member state's concern. For the addition of a new member state's concern, you can see the validation as such is not foreseen in the regulation. Although the, the timelines for the addition of a new member state's concern are indeed uh, a little bit longer compared to the, to the timelines of the other application and the validation per se is not foreseen. Then there is the assessment of part one because the member states can still document consideration against the part one 
particular aspect of, of translation, of course, the assessment of part two, and then um, the decision. Uh, in case there are uh, considerations uh, raised for part one, you can see with the asterisk, I hope you can read the text, is always the RMS in the lead. So even if the added member states concern create and uh, document consideration for the part one will be then for the RMS to raise the, the RFI uh, for part one. And then non-SM uh, do not have, of course, an assessment uh, process. And with this, I'll give the floor to our colleagues for the demo. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So yes, we will continue with the, with the demo. We will start with the substantial modification. So. Um, I will be going to the system again. I will be closing the sessions that we have open so that everything is clear. So we have now here the session open in the authority workspace. I'm going to log out and log in with the sponsor user. So for to demo this part, uh, we have also uh, prepared uh, another trial uh, with um, some pre-populated information. We are not going to use the same one. But we will look for it using the basic search. We'll tap in the clinical trial number. So this is the trial that we have created. Um, it also has two member states. We have kept the same member state structure, Denmark and Spain. Also the same, the same product. It's actually a copy of the one that we used before. So if I click on the clinical trial, I will be redirected, as we saw, to the trial summary, where I will see all the information related to, to the, the trial information um, submitted. And uh, if you remember, before we were seeing for our previous application, we were seeing that in the application, sorry, for our previous trial, we were seeing that our application list only included the initial application with two MSCs. So here you can see that a substantial modification has been added in this case. So it is listed here. So any subsequent application or any modification uh, to the trial will be listed here in this part of the trial summary. And we will see also the parts that are composing this application. In this case, the substantial modification that we have submitted is a part one only substantial modification. We will see the list of MSCs. In case it was a part two only, we will see only the, the relevant member states. We can see the submission date, decision date. So if we access the substantial modification, we will see the form here. So you will see that the, the structure is very similar to what we had in the, in the initial. We also have the form, the MSCs, the part one, the part two, the evaluation and the timetable. We will now see in a minute how to create one, but I just want to show how it would look like because after we have uh, subsequent applications or modifications to the trial, um, regardless if this is done through a substantial modification in this case, for example, or through a change application as part of a request for information, as we have uh, shown in the, in the previous section, we will see um, the cumulative uh, changes in the, in the latest view of the, of the application. And we have a way to identify where all those changes are coming from apart from the highlight of changes functionality that we already shown uh, when we were doing these uh, modifications as part of an RFI, where we would have the, the yellow highlight here. Um, and something that, by the way, is also important is that every time that we have a change, we will see this little icon here to indicate that there have been changes. And if we can, if we just hover and put our mouse on the icon, we will see the ID of the application or RFI where this change was made. In case uh, a field is changed more than once, we will see the latest one. So that's a way that we have to see the changes. And another way to see 
any potential changes to our original originally submitted application would be to go to the versions drop down here that we will have uh, in each part we will have one for the part one and another one for the part two because as we already explained the changes will be different in case the RFIs are sent for part one or the substantial modification scope is only the part one um, the versions will be only created for the part one and if it's the part two it will be only for the part two so here in the drop down we will see the different versions with the ID and it's very important that we um, pay attention to this ID so that we can identify where the changes are coming from so we will have a first version that it's the EN uh, the IN, sorry, the, the initial application and the date. In this case, since we are doing everything on the same day, um, the date is not really giving us uh, much information on that, but uh, in a normal flow where the substantial modifications or the RFIs will be submitted in different days, that can also help us identifying the changes. So we have the initial application, then we have an RFI, uh, remember that we already explained that the RFI ID will be composed of the CT number plus the the ID of the of the RFI, which would be in this case the the number, the initial application RFI number one. We have an SM, a first SM that has been created, so that will be version three, and we have a fourth version which has been created as part of an RFI, but from an SM. If you compare this record to the, this one, we will see that the city number is obviously the same, but in, in number two, version number two, let's say, we have initial application 01, so that will be the first RFI in the initial. And in this one, we see SM01001, which, which means that this change has been done in SM1, so the first SM submitted to this uh, clinical trial, because of course we can have more than one, and uh, that will be the first RFI in this SM, and we have the, the date. So we can actually go back to the initial version. So here we will be seeing the first version submitted, and if we go to the versions, we will see, as we are in the initial, we will see the version in uh, corresponding to this initial application because we have changed from the substantial to the initial and in case we want to see the substantial versioning we can go here and we will see SM1 and the RFI so we can click here we will be redirected to the substantial modification and we will see the original information in the SM Okay, and we will also see the blue dot here indicating the changes. And when uh, there's a, another hint as well to identify the changes, in case a change has been made as part of an RFI, the icon will be yellow. And in case the changes are made as part of an SM or a non-SM, the icon will be blue. That will be the, the main difference. And we will see that this change has been done in SM part and in SM1, sorry. Okay, so this is how a, a substantial modification will look like once it's submitted and, and authorized, actually. So if we want to submit one, how do we do it? So we will need to go to the trial summary. And from the trial summary, we have this create button. And we can select a uh, a single trial substantial modification in, in case we want to create a substantial modification application only for this trial, a multi-trial substantial modification in case we want to create one single SM but that um, applies changes to more than one trial at the same time, a non-substantial modification or an additional MSC. So any Subsequent application needs to be created from here, from the trial summary. So let's click on a single trial substantial modification to see how it's done and what we can find there. So the first thing that we need to select is the scope. We need to decide whether our substantial modification is part one only, part two only, or part one and part two. So that will um, restrict what we can change 
in the in the application. So let's uh, select part one and part two. And after we select uh, that the part two will be included in our substantial modification, we need to choose the country or countries that we want to um, include. So in this case, Spain. Let's just uh, select uh, Spain. No, let, let's check them all just in case. And um, do you want to update the current information in the dossier? We check it and we click on create. Okay, so we have our draft application created. And so what we see now is this blue banner that we saw, if you remember, when we were creating also a draft version uh, as part of an RFI. So we will have the same thing, but in this case, instead of having the RFI ID, we will have the SM ID. In this case, it's SM2, because if you remember, there was already an SM created, which was SM1. And we can also go back to the submitted application to check the, the previously submitted information. So since we have created the substantial modification with part one and part two for all the MSCs, we will be able to uh, change the application um, in, in all the sections. We will be able to change all the information. So the first thing that we would need to do for a substantial modification, the first mandatory document that we need to upload is the cover letter. We need to include a new cover letter for that application in the form. So let's add one document. Right, um, SM. Sorry, I'm still struggling with my keyboard. <laughs> okay, I attach it. So again, the document will be for publication by default if we want to add a second document that will be not for publication. Here, we can do it from here. Okay, we'll cancel this one, and just stick to this one. And the second mandatory document that we need to um, select is the modification description. That also has an asterisk, so this means that we need to upload it. Okay, also for publication by default. And we have the option to add a second document not for publication. Okay, and uh, for a substantial modification, we can also select the reason for the substantial modification. For example, in case, and we will see that uh, when we get to the notifications, in case uh, a trial is halted and we want to restart it, we would need uh, to submit an SM and we can specify here that this SM has been done to restart the trial. So we can select the reason and we can also select the scope of the substantial modification. So the rest of the information is the information coming from the initial application. And uh, I just wanted to show that as per what Laura was mentioning in her introductory uh, speech to this section, the deferrals cannot be modified. We cannot see the, the padlock here, which means that we cannot change anything. The deferrals will be inherited from the initial application. So that will be for the form. I have finished my changes, so I will click on the padlock. As you can see, the behavior is exactly the same as in the initial application in terms of uh, populating the application and filling in the details. We will have the, lo the locks. We need to use them. We can uh, change also some information in the member states uh, section. Of course, we cannot add member states concerned. Also, as Laura mentioned, we have a dedicated uh, additional MSc application for that, but we can change the number of subjects, for example, in the existing member states. Then if we go to the part one, since remember we are working on, a, on an SM that is part one and part two, we will have all the logs here in the part one. So let's go to the trial details, for example. 
we will see all the changes enabled here for a change. The same fields, exactly the same structured data and documents that we had uh, before are here, they are all editable. We also have, just let me quickly close this before I move on. We can also have the sponsor section change. We also have the padlock and the product section. We can also make some changes in the product section. Then for the bar two, we have the lock enabled for the two member states. So we can also change the trial sites information or any of the documents uploaded to the part. So that will be it for the, for the substantial modification application creation. As you can see, it's uh, basically the same as the initial application with the slight difference of the, of the form sections where we need to add some additional documents and the deferrals cannot be, cannot be changed. And um, in the case of a substantial modification, I will just go back to the presentation. Just to clarify on the assessment phases, once we submit a substantial modification, if the substantial modification is part one and part two, we would need to go through all the assessment phases, the same assessment phases as for an initial application. Validation, assessment of the part one, assessment of the part two, and decision. In case we uh, choose to select, uh, to create a, and a substantial modification that is part one only, we will only have the validation, the assessment of the part one, obviously, and the decision. We will not have an assessment of the part two. In case we choose a, an SM part two only, we will have the validation, the assessment of the part two, and the decision. Okay, so that would be it for the substantial modifications. And uh, now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Melis, who will guide you through the rest of the applications. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Um, so I'm going to use the same application for to describe the uh, next subsequent ap applications. So here we are still in the sponsor workspace. Uh, we can see the draft application here that's uh, just created by Olga. I will just cancel this to have a fresh start. Now uh, we can only see the initial application and the substantial modification here. So uh, from the create button here on the right corner, um, we have seen that the single trial substantial modification, now I will jump to the non-substantial modification application. So the uh, pop-up is the same. Uh, we need to select the modification scope. Uh, it can be either part one only, part two only, or part one and part two. Um, we've seen the part one and part two for SM applications, so I will select part one only for this case. I will create. Now uh, our application, draft application has been created. So we are seeing the status is draft. Uh, new version draft, the banner says us this is a, a draft version of non-SM application. On the left, we have uh, same tabs, form, MSC, part one and part two. So start with uh, form, form details, uh, non-SM application, uh, by means of the change in the fields, uh, data and document, it is very limited to comparison to other applications. So in the form section, only uh, think I can update and make changes here for the non-substantial modification description. So I need to describe my modification description here. Okay. So for the other uh, documents, for the compliance with regulation, we don't have any uh, lock icon, so I cannot change anything. Deferrals, again, same with the SM application. Um, we cannot change anything. We can only uh, see what has been 
um, submitted so far. Uh, these are all read only. So I will just unlock here the form. Application is saved again. Next in the uh, MSC top here, I am not able to add any new member states. I can only change the subjects as we seen before in SM application. Now in part one, here I have the lock icon. Uh, part one is also the same accordions with the um, rest of the applications. I will just unlock, lock it, sorry. Now uh, here the trial identifiers, full title, uh, full title languages, we can see uh, those yellow boxes, uh, Olga just explained, those were the changes in the previous applications. Here uh, only think uh, there are some um, data fields that I can change. So for example, protocol code, I am able to update it. Also for the uh, sections that I make some changes, I can also uh, describe here what has been changed. Still in part one, as you can see, I can add therapeutic area. I can change the main objective. Again, the section changes description for the users to uh, describe what has been changed in this cha uh, sections. Also in the sponsor, if I just lock it. Here I can add new contact for the third party or I can change the uh, first name, last name, phone number and email. Same goes for the pub public contact point. I am able to update the name. I will unlock to save the application for the part one also. The application is saved. So since this was a, a part one application, part one only application, we cannot check uh, part two uh, or do some updates in part two. So with all this, um, I am able to submit the non-SM. So after I've submitted this application for the non-SM application, as we seen before in the slides, uh, there is no validation process. So uh, I will just submit it system warns me that I didn't log. Yeah, application is saved. And uh, with the changes so far, uh, I can submit this application and there won't be any uh, evaluation process for the non-SM application. So, after the non-SM application, the next subsequent application we can uh, submit, we can create a draft version, is the additional member state application. Um, here from the pop-up, uh, I can select the member states that I'm going to submit this application for. So let's select Austria here. And also another member state application for Belgium. So with this pop-up, uh, I can identify the member states that, uh, for the additional member state application. Then after I uh, click it, the system is going to create a two uh, draft application, one for Belgium, one for Austria. I will just open one of them. Again, uh, in the additional member state application, we have the form top, form details. So here uh, we have the cover letter we have seen before in the SM application, also initial applications. So to be able to submit this uh, application, I need to upload my cover letter for additional member state application.
Also here I can upload a proof of payment of fee document for Austria, the MSC that I'm creating the uh, application for. Again, uh, we can see that deferrals uh, are only uh, are read-only mode. I cannot change anything here. The next uh, tab is MSC. Our MSC is Austria. Uh, I can update the subjects again. And the part one. So. Uh, for the part one, uh, I am not allowed to change anything. Uh, as you can see, there is no lock icon. I can only view uh, the part one data and the documents here. Only thing I can add for part one uh, is the translations. So for the uh, translations, uh, I can upload da data translations, either data translations or the document translations. So let's upload some couple of translations. We can uh, upload a translation for full title. So I have the, after selecting the full title uh, value from the drop down, now I have the button uh, for translation heading. So I can select the language. I think it was, let's select German. Now the uh, translation also edit here, full title translation. Also same for the documents. I can select protocol here to upload a, a translation for the document, uh, for the protocol document. So I have the add document button here. I can select the document and it is protocol translation. Language, I need to select the language and attach. From here also the previous versions uh, expand link. We can see all the previous versions coming from the uh, previous applications. And our translation is here. So I will just lock it again. The application is saved. Next, also the part two. So part two uh, layout is exactly the same we have seen in the initial application uh, with the same sections, recruitment arrangement, uh, suitability of the investigator. Here I need to populate all these fields for uh, Austria. So I need to add an organization for my country. And then I need to upload recruitment arrangements, uh, subject information and informed consent form, all the mandatory documents I need to upload. Financial and other arrangements here also. The documents we have seen before. Then after uh, providing all the mandatory documents, I will be able to submit, submit the additional member state application. So, with this, uh, we have finished with the subsequent applications. Uh, I'm giving floor back to Laura for the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the demo session, very informative. Now we have some questions, new questions. You can see now um, in, the, in the chat in Slido, and maybe <laughs> one of them is quite popular. Uh, is with 50 thumbs up. So I think we should at least mention this, but more details maybe will be provided later on. Is it allowed to submit not only wet signed documents, but also documents with electronic signatures? Uh, so maybe more details can be provided later on. I just wanted to emphasize on this point, but it's a more a general comment in case you have personal data. So in case of a white signatures or any other personal data, just really to emphasize this point, because protections of personal data is really important when using CTIS. You have seen it from Melis and Olga that when you upload documents, you will have two versions. 
one for publication and one not for publication. So should any personal data be needed, I'm not going here into the details of the, uh, of the question as such, uh, but if we think about, for example, wet signatures or other personal data, so it's more a general comment, please remember that these personal data should go in the slot of the documents not for publication and then should be anonymized uh, before they are uploaded in the slot for publication because what goes public, uh, of course, in the documents should not contain any personal data in line with Article 81.4. So maybe more, uh, more details on this on the wet signature and electronic signature also later on um, when colleagues from the Commission and other panelists will join us. In relation to this, there is another popular um, question on whether guidance will be provided on the reduction. And the answer is yes, you must have heard before. We are working on a guideline document that we hope to finalize by quarter one of 2022 on the protection of personal data and um, CCI in the documents uploaded in CTIS. Just if I, I can comment on this, please remember that the use of the ferals has really been introduced in the system to alleviate the burden of reduct CCI elements in the documents that are published. So the possibility that you have to delay the publication of some documents uh, up to seven years for category one, five years for category two and so on is really to give you the possibility to protect the CCI. But coming back to the question, the answer is yes. Uh, there is a guideline that is currently being drafted, almost finalized, that will then be um, published or, or, or disseminated anyway, um, hopefully in quarter one uh, of 2022. So just to cover two of these hot topics uh, that, we'll, uh, that were raised in the, in the chat in, in Slido, um, maybe uh, talking about uh, the ferals um, at this point, I could ask my, uh, my colleague Marianne uh, from the member states, um, and, and the question reads, sponsors can request the ferals, but it's up to the member states concerned to accept them. What is the current position of the member states? Will they challenge the request or agree with it? Uh, Marianne, if you can expand a bit of this, of course you don't have the answer maybe for all the member states, uh, but your view on this is really welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Yes, as you were saying, I'm only one member state, but I can at least uh, explain our position on this. As, as we see it, we would only uh, challenge the category chosen by the sponsor uh, and not go beyond this. So if the category is fine, we would go with this proposal of the sponsor. Thank you very much, Marianne. And indeed, this is very important. You have seen it from the demo. If the sponsor uh, applies for a deferral of some of their documents, the member states, they can equally apply for a deferral of their assessment reports and their, the RFI raised to the sponsor for a period of time that is equal or shorter. Um, coming back now to the, uh, to the list of questions, um, let me go through the list. Um, maybe... Um, one question for Marianne, I think, was also who will do the validation of the substantial modification for part two? Will it be the RMS or the member states concern? It will be the member states concern. There can be part two uh, substantial modifications that really only go to the, to the specific member states, so it will be this member state. Indeed, everything that pertains to part two is, is indeed competence of, of the member states concerned. RMS is nowhere involved. Rudiger, one question for you. Uh, in case something went wrong, the application has been submitted, is there a short way back after submitting? A mistake was recognized after clicking confirm. What do they do? This, what the sponsor will do? Once you press the submit button, your application is submitted. There is, in principle, no technicality foreseen to make any changes. That's the same on the member state side as well. When an RFI is sent to the sponsor, there is no possibility to revert, revert to change it or make any modifications. So in principle, um, the answer is there is no way back. Um, 
perhaps an option could be to withdraw the application and resubmit, but um, from a short answer here, um, technically this is not possible and foreseen in the system. Thank you very much, Rudiger. Anna, now a question for you um, regarding assessment responses periods. What about public holidays? Are they blocked? And uh, if so, what is the country of reference? What about the winter holiday uh, season? Thank you. Okay, I will try to answer this question, which I think is a, a, a difficult one and, and complex uh, as how it's been implemented in the system. Uh, first of all, to clarify that the regulation refers uh, specifically to another regulations where uh, define how uh, the member state calendar should uh, have been uh, considered in, um, in CTIS and in particular what are the rules to define what is the due date for a particular uh, task. Um, from the moment an application is submitted, uh, there is no RMS selected. So, so at this moment, how it's working the system, that is the, 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 the longest calendar of all those from member state, it has been uh, taken into account. And then from the moment the RMS is selected for uh, part one, uh, it's taken into account the calendar of that uh, RMS. Uh, and for part two, because this is a national cuisine uh, in the system, is um, implemented the calendar of the individual member state consent. And as I said, there is in the regulation certain rules that define when the due date should fall for the different uh, uh, tasks that are in the workflow. And normally for member states, uh, it's uh, the due date cannot fall uh, in a weekend or in a public holiday, if I remember well. I think for a sponsor, the rules are not exactly the same as it's only in the case that it's a public holiday. But Perhaps for this, Olga, you can uh, provide some support because I think we uh, I raised a query around this in the past uh, to have this more clear how that has been implemented. But as I said, that is more or less overall uh, the general rules that we have implemented in the system. I don't know if Olga wants to complement on this. Yes, if I if I may just. Uh add to that exactly uh, for the for the sponsor uh, f for the member states uh, timers of course we have this uh, member states calendar functionality that will be observed for any calculation of the of the due dates and and the timers um, and for the sponsor what we have is we don't have uh, a, a sponsor calendar as such uh, so what we the, the rules that we are observing right now, for example, in the, the due dates that the sponsor may have, which would be the response to an RFI, for example, uh, the, as uh, also we showed uh, when we were creating the RFI, uh, the user will be prompted with a calendar where um, they will have like a maximum of 12 days to to select. And uh, the only rule is that the, the weekends will not be selectable. That would be the, the only the only rule there because there, there's no such thing as sponsor calendars introduced in the in the system no it will only be for the calculation of tasks and and that's only for the authority workspace yes thank you very much anna and, and olga indeed this is a complex uh, matter also in terms of the implementation in the system taking into account the the calendars of the member states and the use of the rms and member states calendars for the various section uh, rudiger or other colleagues would you like to complement further or um, just let me know i think the colleagues have already addressed this uh, maybe but otherwise, please, please take the floor. Okay, um, Rudiger, then one question um, to you uh, in case um, what happens uh, basically when the sponsor will not respect the deadline for the responses to the RFI. Uh, is there a situation when something like this can be accepted? What will happen in CTIS? Very simple. We deal with an uh, IT database that has its specific rules and uh, in many places cannot be manually intervened. Uh, the timelines for passing an RFI response deadline after one second after midnight is that the application is lapsed. There is no possibility to manually interfere with this neither from the member state side. So in the answer is very simple. 
the uh, rules foreseen in the regulation that the application is lapsed if the sponsor does not respond to an RFI response timeline will be that technically the system will lapse the application for the sponsor. Thank you very much, Rudiger. And I think this um, is nicely linked then with another question in the same area, of course, that we that we got. It is about the possibility for the sponsor to request an extension, if that would be uh, possible to request an extension of the responses uh, to the RFI. Maybe, Marianne, you can help us uh, on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, as, as Rudiger already pointed out, there is no technical possibility to extend the timeline. So. Yeah, the simple answer is no. Thank you. Um, Rudiger, I come back to you for a, for a question on uh, is, is a, a topic that we have covered um, extensively also in the training material in, in some of the demos on the addition of the site for part two. So you have seen it from the from the demo given by Olga and Melis that also the details of the clinical investigator sites are retrieved uh, from the OMS, from the organization management system. So this means that the details will have to be there in order for the sponsor to be able to search and select and add the details in, uh, in the CTA. Um, Rudiger, can you comment on this? I think the question was who will be responsible for adding the site in part two. Uh, thank you. We, we can see that question in two ways. Who is responsible for adding the site in part two? Well, this is the application preparer, a part two preparer or the application submitter who is deriving the record from OMS. So the site, the trial site, like any other organization needs to be registered in OMS first and will be then derived from the OMS. And um, the, uh, the, the question who is responsible for that, this is an OMS question more than a CTIS. So the colleagues from the OMS um, experts uh, are more appropriate. All I can say is that there are specific documents required to to register a clinical trial site in OMS and, and uh, the rules in the OMS registration procedure means that if a party is in possession of this authorization of the authorization letter, for instance, for an academia uh, site, then they will treat that as a valid uh, request and the registration can be done. The, um, the, what, coming back to the, to the, to the CTIS aspect, um, it is functionally possible to register a site directly from the CTIS and although the validation may not have passed yet, in the because the, it has, the, has just been registered, it is possible to include that information into the application dossier and proceed with the application. However, it needs to be noted that if the validation is not passed, that record only sits in a local application. If there are any changes, if the if the information is incorrect, it cannot be derived, and it is certainly not the most or actually not the favorable or even recommended approach to uh, associate a clinical trial site into an application. But it could be uh, an exceptional workaround in order to progress with an application. Thank you very much, Rudiger. Then there were some questions, I think, on the templates. Maybe this is also good for a, for a discussion later on. Um, but just to mention in, in Udralex Volume 10, uh, you know the, the website maintained by the Commission, there is uh, a page displaying basically the documents that will be uh, applicable once the regulation goes live. And then there is another tab uh, for, uh, for the requirements under the Clinical Trial Directive. And in the section for Clinical Trials Regulation, you might find already some uh, templates that are published there uh, for uh, for part two but this is just a quick reference maybe we can discuss more in details this aspect uh, also later on um, we were just verifying with with Olga that maybe it would be interesting for you to see um, now that we have taken some of the questions um, a table a functionality that is implemented in the system that really um, gives control to the users 
to see uh, which documents and which versions have been provided during the trial life cycle. You can modify your dossier with an RFI, you can modify the dossier with a substantial modification, and this table I think is good if we show it to, to the colleagues online, really gives you a clear overview of the documentation provided. You can apply filters and you can see which versions of the document has been provided under an RFI or an SM and so on. So Olga, back to you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Yes, uh, th th there's uh, some additional features, as, as Lara was saying, and I'm going to go back to our to our trial for that. Um, there's this document table just uh, for the users to keep track of the different document versions, because as we have been saying, we can have multiple modifications um, going on in one single trial where we can upload different versions of one single document. And it, it can be a bit tricky to, to follow up and to, to know um, what versions have been uploaded. So for that, we have this functionality, the document table, that is available um, in the full trial information section, for example, that would be like the, the best way to see it. The full trial information tab here in the trial summary will contain the latest authorized information for the for the trial. And if we scroll down, we will have this uh, documents table where we can actually have some filters. We can check, uh, we can select the different uh, documents that we have uh, available for, for the, the sections, the document types, and then we can also sort by document title, document version, by date, language. So if we filter, for example, in, in this particular trial, we have uploaded many different versions of the of the protocol document. So just, just so you can see how this will look like, we have four different versions of the protocol for publication. So here you can see that they are all uh, part one, of course, and we can see the submission date. In this case, uh, again, this is not very illustrative because we are doing everything in the same in the same date, which would be obviously not the the real life uh, scenario. We have the system version, we have the language. In this case, all the versions have the same language, English, and we have the um, application where this was submitted. So we have here that version one and two were submitted as part of the initial version three and four were submitted as part of an SM. Um, up, uh, some application, sorry. And if we go to the actual application, we can see that the protocol versions are indeed there. We can also see them as Melis was showing um, directly in the application. We can also see them in the document table inside the application. We can have it here, and in this case, if we do the same filters, for example, the protocol here, we will see the two versions that were submitted in the substantial modification, and we will see also the, the submission sequence, which would imply the original document sent in the SM, and also the document that was uploaded in the RFI that was sent for the SM, which would be version 3 and four. Okay, so that's that's a good way to keep up with all the versions that we that we have in the system for one document table, uh, for the, for one document. Sorry, and we can see where the documents were submitted and when they were authorized. So it's uh, just a, a a good tool for you to keep in mind uh, because that would definitely help you. And of course, you can download. The document by clicking on the on the icon there. See that the document is downloaded. You can download all the different versions um, just for you to compare them. So yep, that's uh, basically it for the document table. Thank you. Okay, I think we can also show you because we can see some questions, um, a question in the in slide about the download. 
you were asking about the download functionality how do you create and download documentation okay there is a, ref a reference to the tmf although of course the, the requirements of the the fact that ctis is in place it does not um let's say maybe cover all the requirements for the uh, uh, archiving in the tmf documentation but maybe it just would be good to show you how the download functionality is implemented and what you can uh, download i was ju just trying to keep the requirements for tmf and, and ctis a little bit separated but maybe olga we can show all or Melissa, I don't know, who will show the, the download functionality. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So uh, for the download, I will just quickly show you what we can do with the sponsor user. Then maybe we can jump to member state uh, to authority workspace to download the same application. So here, uh, next to the create button, so I'm still in the same page for our clinical trial in the summary. And uh, next to the create button, we have this download button here. So by clicking it, I can see all the applications here uh, created, authorized uh, so far. So we have the initial application, we have the substantial modification, non-substantial, and uh, also the uh, additional MSC application in draft status. So uh, to download the application, I need to select which application that I would like to download. So let's select initial application. And then uh, I can see the contents for download. Uh, these are the same tabs we have seen in the inside of the application. So uh, the same uh, structure here, first form, MSC, part one, part two, and the evaluation. So I will select form, uh, MSC. I can select the part two either for Denmark or Spain or both. So let's select Denmark, uh, part one also, and the evaluation. So for the evaluation, we see all the evaluation uh, phases for this application, validation, assessment part one, part two, and decision. Let's select all. And then uh, I can include the following. Uh, either I can select only the documents, then uh, I will see the uh, the documents that this application has or uh, the structure data. So let's select both of them and start the download. I just need to extract the documents. So Bear with me for a minute. And now I'm in the uh, download folder of my computer. So here we have the application initial, which we have just downloaded. And the inside of the folder, we can see the same structure form, MSC part one, part two, and the evaluation. So inside of the form, we will have the documents that's uh, coming from the form, sec form section, cover letter, uh, compliance with regulation and proof of payment. So all those documents were part of form section. So in the downloaded folder, we have the same uh, logic followed. So I will just go back. Also the deferrals. So deferrals are uh, the structured data. So opening the folder, we can see the values coming from. So for this application, actually, we didn't select anything it was only category one so i will go back the msc section will only have the msc info here so we can see the member states concert denmark was our rms so in the structure data we can also identify denmark is our rms so the subjects countries outside the European economic area and the estimated total population for the trial. I will go to the evaluation because in the evaluation we have the RFI. So uh, here in the evaluation, we can see two folders, one for documents of the uh, evaluation of assessment part one and second one is for the RFI. So uh, clicking RFI uh, will open me documents and also the uh, respond of the RFI structure data here. Then we can see the RFI response date, evaluation process, the considerations, sponsor response also here. 
for the documents, we can see uh, the documents uploaded uh, for the changes to the application. We have seen this, the sponsor actually upload these changes to the application when uh, responding to RFI. Also the non-quality and quality document. So uh, for the application, we already mentioned that uh, the users will see the documents regarding to their uh, permissions. So if a if user has quality permissions, then they will see uh, on their screen the quality per, uh, quality documents. So the uh, we have also the same logic uh, for downloads. So users uh, in the download, users also uh, will see what they are seeing on their screen. So with that user, I have already the quality permissions, so that's why I have the quality document available here. But if I don't have a quality permission, then in the download, download I will not see the quality document here in the download, as we have also in the uh, application. And then same for the decision. So for the decision, I have two folder here for each member state, Denmark and Spain. So I can uh, review Denmark's decision in the PDF data. We can see the title of the uh, application, uh, application trial number here, the decision, Denmark authorize. We didn't. Uh, have any conditions because we select the authorize but if we have the authorize with conditions then in the authorization task we should uh, provide some conditions then the same conditions will be actually uh, will be displayed here also so that was it for the download from a sponsor so I think uh, that's uh, uh, that will give the quick idea of how download works. So thank you. Thank you, Melis, for the addition. Actually, it was not in the agenda, but I think it was good that we that we should. Okay, we have ten minutes left before the uh, the lunch break, starting at one o'clock. So maybe we can take some more questions. Um, Marianne, uh, one question in uh, regarding the multi-trial uh, substantial modification. So in case the sponsor selects different trials and applies only one SM that then goes to the, to the, um, that is applicable to the different trials, who will be the RMS in that case? Thank you, Laura. Uh, it will be more a uh, um, sponsor concept, the multi-trial SM than a member state concept because on member state side, the trial will remain as is and the, the original uh, RMS will remain and the assessment will take place on trial basis. So perhaps I can give uh, the word to, to Rüdiger as well. Thank you, Marianne. When you actually read the regulation and how it's been implemented, it means the sponsor shall request one thing, shall propose one single request for authorization. So in fact, it means one one of the trials considered a master trial will carry the cover letter for all and then the information will be uploaded as long as the same set of documents and the products are identical and will be pushed into all the other reference trials but as soon as the sponsor presses the submit button what will happen the evaluation will switch to trial level evaluations for those trials that are both in the master and in the reference trials. So as Marianne has stated, on the trial evaluation perspective, it remains trial level. It is only one single request that the sponsor initially poses, but as soon as the press, submit button is pressed, it switches to a trial level evaluation and decision. Thank you very much, um, uh, Rudiger and Marianne. Uh, Anna, a question for you. Um, and I think we, we mentioned this already during the demo, but it's really important to focus a little bit on the user roles so that um, colleagues on the line get familiar. Is there a sponsor user role who can perform all the steps and tasks as part of the, of the application? It is important in small uh, sponsor companies organization. Thank you, Anna. Yes. Yes, I think in those cases uh, you have the city administrator role that can perform all business activities in the system with the exception of the submission of the ASR, meaning that in those cases you need to combine the city admin role 
with the ASR submitter because as, as we said, uh, you can raise the profile of user uh, by the combination of roles. So if you want to have a super, super user that can do everything, then city admin combined with the ASR submitter. If you want to focus only on activities related to evaluation of clinical trials, the city admin can perform all business activities. Perfect, Anna. Thank you so much. Rudiger, maybe before we conclude, a couple of questions for you. The first one being, can we submit a substantial modification when we have the initial application under evaluation for any of the member states concerned? Yes, and here we need to differentiate what we mean with substantial modification in terms of what aspect is provided. And uh, in fact, I I, I would even ref, um, make reference to the Q&A provided by the European Commission, the question 3.5. So when when we look at the part two substantial modification, then as soon as any member state concerned has issued their initial decision and the decision is, is, is positive, which is authorized or authorized with conditions, and there is no other part two substantial modification ongoing, then it is possible to submit a substantial modification. With respect to a substantial modification that affects part one or part one and two, but obviously part one would then still be affected, then the reference is, is, is clear that all decisions which have received by the member states initially, either in the staggered approach, Article 5 or Article 11, need to have a decision before we will then have a substantial modification to be to be submitted in in the case um, if it affects its effects part one, there will be an implementation of the um, of a staggered approach, but this functionality will be deployed at a later stage of um, of a future release enhancement, and this has also been notified in the Q and A by the Commission. Thank you so much. And the very last question, I think, before we break for, for lunch, is about. Um, the public uh, contact point in the sponsor uh, uh, details in part one. Can this be a mailbox of functional uh, contact details, Rudiger? Yes, in fact. And when you look at the application section, it even says that you should provide a functional contact point both for the scientific contact point as well as also for the public contact point, and both can be the same. Excellent. I think now we are really on time with the, with the agenda. We had a lunch break scheduled for one o'clock. So also in order for to have some rest for our speakers and the, and the panelists, I think we can break now and then we will meet again in 45 minutes. Um, thank you, Marianne, for putting the, the next <laughs> already a preview of what we will cover next is about notifications. So we will go through the notifications that the sponsor can submit and supervision activities focusing on corrective measure. But this is next, is in 45 minutes, so have a nice uh, lunch break. Thank you. <laughs>